<laughs> but that was my book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness let's see Okay, Mr. Marshall, uh, we are recording. You are the co-host to this meeting. Amherst Media is with us tonight. Uh, the attendees are coming on in. You have a full house for board, and it is 6.33, according to my clock. Good to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 3rd, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda Post it on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship, or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then return to mute. Bruce Cold. I'm here. Brad Hartwell. I am here. Jesse Major. I'm here. Uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remute, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay. Uh, all right, the first item, uh, it's now 6.37 and uh, I have a question for Pam, actually, or Chris. Um, customarily, we would do minutes at this time. Um, I see, Pam, that your opening comments say there that the January 31 minutes were in already for mm -hmm. approval. However, I don't believe I received them in my packet. Uh, were they in the general packet? 
No, because those actually were approved at the last meeting or the okay. meeting before. So that was just a holdover. Okay. And I, I know Chris, Chris has something to say. Yeah, I know she distributed another set of minutes. Yeah. Uh, Chris, is that what you wanted to say? Yes, I sent out the October 4th, 2023 minutes. It was either yesterday or the day before. Um, I apologize for them being so late, um, but they seem to be um, very much of interest to people who are interested in the Shootsbury Road project. So that'll be coming back to the zoning board soon. So it would be good if you could review the October 4th minutes, either tonight or at your next meeting, which is April 17th. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so board members, have you all had a chance to look over those minutes? I know I, I did take, did look at them. Uh, I've seen, see, just raise your physical hand if you looked at them. One, two, three, maybe four of us, five. So maybe everybody but Fred looked at them. Uh, board members, uh, I did, did. I did look at them. I have my hand up. Oh, you have your digital hand yeah. up. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's oh, that's what I thought. That's what you meant. Okay. Um, so, do people feel comfortable reviewing and possibly approving them this evening, or do people want to wait? I guess. Um, I'm seeing Jesse's thumbs up on going ahead. Fred, uh, Johanna, Karen. So that leaves Janet and Bruce to. Uh, Doug, I, I was not at the meeting. So although I read them, I will uh, abstain. You'll so I'm, I'm good with reviewing them, but okay. just that's why I didn't put my hand up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janet. Um. So is so could we wait till next week for Bruce to see them or was Bruce, I mean, next meeting. Well, it sounds like I've I've seen them, I've read them, but I'm 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 in no position to determine whether they're accurate or not because I wasn't at the meeting. Oh, okay. I I was a little yeah. I read the January minutes and I thought I've seen these before and I was but now I realize it wasn't just me. I, you know, we can vote on them. I don't really remember everything from that meeting, but you know that. Okay. All right. Um... All right, so does anybody have any comments on the minutes as drafted? All right, this is probably the benefit of doing the minutes long after the meeting. <laughs> Very few comments. Johanna. Um, it's also helpful that we have a recording. Uh, so, you know, I thought the details looked good and I moved to approve the minutes from October 4th. So that's a motion to approve? All right, uh, Jesse. I'll second that. Okay. All right. Any any more bet any more comments from the board, or shall we go right into our vote? Okay. Uh, all right. We'll do a roll call. Uh, Bruce, I'm going to call on you, though I know what you're going to say. I'll abstain. Yes. Okay. Fred. I vote yes. Approve. Thank you. Jesse? Approve. All right. Janet? Um, yes. Approve. Oh, yes. Approve. Sorry. Johanna? I'm an I. Thank you. Karen? I approve. That's an I as well. And I'm, I'm an I as well. So we have six members in favor, one abstention, and no no's. Great. All right, the time now is 6.42 and we'll go into the second item on the agenda. Uh, we have a great, uh, wait, let's see, we have, looks like we have 18 participants this evening um, and I will read their names and then we can, uh, during the time I read the names, uh, members of the public, you can start raising your hands if you want to make a public comment about an item that's not on a later item on our agenda. I see Barry Roberts, Brad Hutchinson, Hutchison, Bruce Ehrlich, Elizabeth Veerling, Eric Bachrock, Gail Flood, Hetty Startup, Jamie Gruber, 
Jenny Kalick, Jonathan Salvan, Kathleen Bridgewater, Kenneth Roberts, Mara Keene, Michael Lipinski, Michelle McArda, Renee Moss, Robert Azuka, and Sharon Pabinelli and Mary Brawl as one, one participant. Okay, any members of the public, do you want to make a comment on this time about something that's not listed later as a topic for this meeting? <clears throat> okay, I don't see any hands from the public. And with that, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic on the agenda. All right, time now is 6.43, and we will go to the Comprehensive Permit for Belchertown Road and East Street School Project Eligibility Letter. Excuse me, presentation, discussion, and opportunity to offer comments regarding the project eligibility application submitted to the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities for preliminary review of their proposed development, including approximately 78 mixed income apartments at 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belchertown Road. Chris, uh, your hand's up, and I hope you're going to make an introduction to this topic for us. Yes, I have an introductory statement. I hope it doesn't overlap too much with um, Jamie Gruber, but I'll, um, it, I think it'll help you to put this in context. Um, good evening. My name is Chris Brester, Planning Director. Uh, Wayfinders is proposing to develop approximately 78 mixed income apartments at 31 Southeast Street, which is the site of the old East Street School and 70 Belcher Town Road. These locations are proposed to be per permitted and funded as one project. The project is seeking a comprehensive permit or 40B for the development of affordable apartments at these locations. This is a similar process to the one we used for home the home ownership project on Ball Lane and the support supportive apartment project at 132 Northampton Road. Wayfinders is a local nonprofit corporation that has been in existence for 50 years. I think they used to have a different name. I think they used to be called HAP Housing, if I'm not mistaken. And HAP Housing helped the town to develop Olympia Oaks Affordable Housing Project in North Amherst. The proposed development will provide affordable apartments for extremely low, low and moderate income individuals. The project has been in the works for a long time. The town has been working with the Housing Trust for years on the possible development of affordable housing at the East Street School. And the town also recently purchased property on Belcher Town Road with the intent of using it to develop affordable housing. The town purchased the Belcher Town Road property with about $730,000 in CPAP or, C CPAC or Community Development, um, excuse me, Community Preservation Act funds. In addition, the town has agreed to contribute an additional hundreds of thousands of dollars toward the development of the site. This is a good location for an affordable housing project since it is located on the edges of the East Amherst Village Center. There will be a new school built nearby. There are services, including shops, restaurants, and, uh, shops and restaurants, and both sites have bus routes that go right by them. Um, there are community gardens nearby, as well as conservation lands that, to provide uh, a place for people to grow food and also for recreation. The project will be split into two sites with the Southeast Street site, reusing the East Street School building and adding units there for a total of about 31 apartments. On the Belcher Town Road site, there will be one new building with a total of about 48 apartments. The comprehensive permit process consists of two main phases. One is the state level project eligibility determination, and the second is the local review process by the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the state subsidizing agency in this case is EOHLC, Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. We used to know them by another name. Wayfinders submitted an application 
for a project eligibility letter, which we call a PEL, to EOHLC, and that agency will provide a written determination of project eligibility. EOHLC then forwarded the PEL application to the town for comment, and the letter was received by the town on March 21st, and the town has 30 days to submit comments to the state. The documents, or excuse me, the comments are due to the state by April 22nd. So the planning board is being asked to review the project in general, in a general way, based on tonight's presentation and based on the materials that you've reviewed, either online or in your packets. Planning board members should take into account the things that the planning board normally looks at when reviewing a project, but keep in mind that the project is only in the conceptual design phase. Things you might consider are whether the site in this location is generally appropriate for residential development, and whether the conceptual design is generally appropriate for the site. The planning board may choose to make a recommendation to the state that this is an appropriate project to be built on in this location in town. However, the planning board is not required or obligated to make a recommendation. If the board chooses not to make a recommendation on this project, individual board members may still submit comments as residents of Amherst. And the place where individual comments can be submitted can be found by clicking on the link that is on the planning board agenda for tonight's meeting. The project, if it goes ahead, will eventually come back to the planning board once it has been fully designed and submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a comprehensive permit. So the planning board will have another opportunity to comment on the project at that time. Now I'd like to introduce Jamie Gruger, Gruber of Wayfinders to present the project. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and welcome, Jamie. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that, uh, that, that introduction. And uh, I'm going to share my screen here and start the presentation. Can you all see my screen? I believe we okay, can. Great. great, thank you. Uh, good evening, and I'd like to thank you all for having me here tonight to discuss our proposed development in Amherst. I'm Jamie Gruber, a project manager at Wayfinders, and I will start with a brief overview of our organization and then move on to the development plans. Uh, Wayfinders builds and advocates for a thriving and equitable region by improving the stability and economic mobility of families and individuals together with the de developing and managing a wide range of housing to support strong communities. It is our mission statement and our organization provides services in the housing arena from homelessness through home ownership. The real estate development team that I am a part of focuses on the creation and the preservation of affordable housing. Our main offices are located in Springfield and we provide services throughout Western Mass. Wayfinders currently owns and manages approximately 800 rental units in Western Mass across multiple sites, primarily up and down the I-91 corridor. Here are a few of our developments that include Butternut Farms, Olympia Oaks in Amherst. In Northampton, we have Live 155 in the Lumberyard on Pleasant Street, along with Sargent House on Bridge Street. Library Commons is one of our Holyoke developments as well. Uh, in November 2021, Wayfinders answered the town of Amherst's request for proposals to develop two town-owned properties, the former East Street School at 31 Southeast Street and the town-owned land at 70 Belcher Town Road. As part of the RFP process, the town reviewed Wayfinders' proposal and selected Wayfinders as the preferred developer. We have completed much of our due diligence and have progressed the design and preparation of permitting the development via the comprehensive permit process through the town's uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. The proposed development includes two sites to the east of downtown Amherst. 31 Southeast Street will create 31 units and includes an adaptive reuse of, of the school and 70 Belcher Town Road create 47 units. In order to maximize the housing provided, we look to the most most efficiently use the buildable area at each site. 
Our plans include buildings that will provide barrier-free housing and elevator access to all floors and units. The buildings will be designed with sustainability as a core goal and will incorporate energy efficiency measures consistent with passive house and enterprise green communities. The buildings will be all electric and will seek to install solar arrays for on-site renewable energy. Once the buildings are complete, Wayfinder's property management team will be on site, allowing for a meaningful presence for future residents. Um, here's a table that shows the income distribution of unit types, and some of these numbers may change, but this is generally where they will fall. Uh, approximately 68 of the 78 units will be income restricted, while the remaining 10 will be reserved as market rate units. These income restricted units will be designated for residents based upon their household income. The household income is in terms of a percentage of area median income or AMI. And the Department of Housing and Urban Development or HUD publishes values based upon a geographic locations each year. Currently in the Amherst area, the 100% AMI for a family of four is uh, just under 100,000. So based on this chart, chart 23 of the units will be for families and then individuals with earnings of 30% of the AMI or less. And seven of the units will be for families or individuals uh, with earnings 50% or less of the AMI. Uh, 19 of the units will be for families or individuals with earnings 60% uh, of the AMI or less. And 19 of the units will be for families or individuals earning up to 80% of AMI. And then 10 of the units will be market rate units. Um, here are a few photos showing the existing Southeast East Street school site. You see the school and, and, um, and, and the area in the front. Um, it's across the street is the, the common in the, in, the, in the foreground there. And uh, the proposed development at Southeast Street School create 31 units ranging from studios to three bedrooms. Uh, the development involves the adaptive reuse of the school uh, and, it's, and that will have six mixed income housing units and it includes an addition of 25 uh, mixed income units. And it'll be connected to the existing school and share um, an elevator creating a total of 31 rental units. Um, the work to the school includes replacement of all the windows, repair and repointing of the exterior masonry, reconfiguration of the interior of the school building to create residential apartment units. Uh, the new construction will seamlessly connect to the school featuring a central patio and main entrance equipped with an elevator for accessibility across all levels in both buildings. Here's a rendered site plan for the Southeast Street um, location. The proposed construction is shown along the, um, um, uh, along the road uh, connected to the existing um, school and the field in the rear or Western portion of the property will be retained by the town and uh, will be undeveloped. Um, and here is a closer look at the Southeast Street site plan. Uh, the footprint of the existing school is shown in red and the new construction portion is shown in TAM uh, along and aligned with the road. Uh, the on-site parking area will be located in generally the same location as the existing school's parking, and uh, there'll be a pedestrian path along the southern side of the property um, that will allow for access to the town-owned field um, that would be in the upper uh, left-hand portion of the screen. Um, the new construction will have a community room for residents that will open up directly to the uh, outdoor patio and courtyard area. Now at the other site on Belcher Town Road, um, here are some photos um, of, of that site um, that the town had uh, uh, purchased for, for affordable housing. And uh, the current site has two vacant single family homes that um, will be um, removed or demolished as part of that, um, as, as, as part of the redevelopment. Um, at uh, Bel the Belcher Town Road will be entirely new construction. Um, the the three-story building will create 47 units with a mix ranging from studios to three bedrooms as well. And the building will have a combination of flat and pitched roofs 
echoing traditional barn architecture of New England, while creating the appearance of a series of connected smaller buildings. Uh, the building's configuration will provide several roofs oriented in for so solar arrays. Similar to the East Street School, elevator access will be provided to all levels, and there will be indoor bike storage, laundry room, community room for the residents, in addition to a management office. Um, this is the rendered site plan of the Belcher Town Road location, and it is across the street from Colonial Village. Uh, the building is sited aligned with the road and with the parking and drop-off pickup area to the rear of the building here. Um, and then it backs up to uh, the conservation wetlands area back here. Uh, the U-shaped footprint allows for a common uh, patio courtyard area for residents that will also connect directly to the community room within the building. Um, and here's a closer look at the Belcher Town Road site plan. Um, as noted before, the parking is located in the rear of the building and the U-shaped um, uh, footprint allows for the common patio with the uh, um, community room in this area for the residents to use. Um, here's a, a schedule of the development is currently in the design due diligence phase and we have submitted our application to the state. Um, to start the permitting process uh, with the town. Uh, following the permitting with the town, we will pursue our financial and funding applications with the state's Executive Office of Housing and, and Livable Communities, or EOHLC, uh, formerly known as um, uh, DHCD as well. Uh, due to the competitive funding round uh, process, we expect the financing to be complete, um, leading the development into construction in uh, 2027. And with the start of construction, we anticipate a uh, 18 month construction period wrapping up and being fully leased in 2028. Um, as mentioned before, we recently submitted our project eligibility application or PEL application to EOHLC or HLC, um, which is the first step in the comprehensive permitting process. And I would like to thank the town and planning board members for providing us the opportunity to present the proposed development and welcome any comments that you may have for discussion. Um, and I hope this presentation this evening has provided you with the information that will allow for your support of the development at both sites. Um, if there are any additional questions, I'll be happy to address them. And thank you very much. That concludes my uh, presentation. All right, thank you, Jamie. All right, board members, um, I guess we'll open the floor for questions and comments. Bruce? I've got four uh, questions, but I'll take three of them um, and then let others in. Uh, the fourth one is a little more uh, um, uh, elaborate. Um, the first is, uh, uh, um, Jamie, the the open space behind the uh, East Street project, you mentioned what it was intended for, but I didn't quite hear it. Um, that space there, a very large space, kind of tied in behind houses. I don't know how accessible it is, but it could be I, all sorts of possibilities. But what did you say the intended use is for that, that space? Right. So um, when when the development was put um, uh, through the uh, RFP process, the, the town wanted to retain that portion for whether or not they um, for, for some use that they they wanted. They wanted to maintain the access along the southern portion of the property line here so that uh, people would be able to to get back there. This okay. site is um, and the the it. it there's there's also a a wetlands line that you can see right here this is shown in red which sort of um goes around the existing parking area yeah. so the the whole field is sort of a you know a wet wetlands area that that would not be um developed and the town is um you know is looking into it's my understanding the town's looking into you know how, how best to utilize that space. okay that's 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 quite sufficient uh, number two, Bruce, um, Bruce? You, oh, sorry. Uh, Chris has her hand up. Maybe she can elaborate on that. 
You know, there are a couple of issues about that property. Um, one is that it has, it's currently considered a wetland because um, water has been backing up there for a long time. There's a blocked culvert that is being proposed to be cleared. And it's possible that at some point in the future, that area will be more um, dry and able to be used for play fields, not formal play fields. But you can see from this uh, picture that was just shown previously that um, Watson Farms and the um, townhouses on Main Street, as well as a lot of single family homes um, surround the project. And um, it would be very nice to have a play area for children who live at Watson Farms or the Main Street housing. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Good. All right. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, number two, Jamie, you mentioned uh, Passive House. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure how familiar my colleagues are with that. But to me, Passive House is a brand uh, for a, a building performance. And it's uh, an exceptionally high. It's the highest. Uh, at least it was when I retired 10 years ago. Um, so have, have do you mean the actual brand passive house uh, performance you're going to uh, pursue a passive house registration yes that is that is um that is correct yep we are we oh, are in the process okay. of that and we're working with a sustainability consultant that's um a passive house consultant that is is working with our architect to um to pursue that at at both sites will this be the first project that you've sought and and hopefully achieved or have you achieved or sought or achieved this standard before um, for, for, for the Wayfinders team, it, it will be, I, it, it's my understanding that it'll be the first passive house for our sustainability consultant and our architect. It's one of, um, in our, in our development team, it, it's, it's one of, uh, projects that they've, they've worked on and, and have, um, been able to, um, you know. Well, congratulations, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, this is, uh, um, a quite extraordinary standard. I mean, for example, the uh, the air tightness and so forth is probably four times as tight as, uh, or three times as tight, three or four times as tight as the average uh, well built house uh, currently is achieving. So uh, it's a difficult standard to achieve, or it was ten years ago. Uh, number three, um, and then I'll stop for a moment. Um, the uh, I, I this is a good one because I think the site plan you've used this site quite nicely. Um, the building is close to the street, but it's a um, there's a common in uh, between that and the main thoroughfare here, and I think it fits very nicely um, uh, and, and a very nice and, and fulsome use of the site. Can you flick to the site plan for the uh, Belchertown Road site? Um, it this one it seems to me that the building is pushed way up close to the road. It's a big building. And uh, this is a fairly open uh, roadway. I mean, the space around the building, you can see it from here how, uh, and so uh, this is a, a gateway road to Amherst. And I'm just a little concerned that there's going to, it'll be a little shocking to suddenly encounter this building pushed hard up against the road for what looks like a, a couple of hundred feet of, uh, of frontage at least. Uh, my question is, are you forced to do this by wetlands or site constraints, or would you have the option of uh, um, pushing it back uh, um, as much, you know, uh, pushing it back to twice the distance that you've currently got? Yeah, yeah. so th that's that's an excellent question. And um, there is there is wetlands, a wetlands line there as well that um, that we are are working with. And um, in order to to, um, you know, put the parking area there, that was we are constrained with with space and for, um, you know, different different drainage measures and, and, and designs and that sort of thing. And I also believe that there was some input um, possibly from the. Uh, from from the town as 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 it related to that area and possibly being considered sort of a, a you know a village um area so entering that so they had asked that we had cited it closer to the road um we had you know other plans that that showed it you know in different kind of configurations on the lot and that's and that's and that's where it landed thank you jamie i will probably at least from my personal presence on the board be uh uh 
arguing that certainly I personally and uh, perhaps my colleagues would uh, argue to the town uh, uh, officials who are pushing you up against the road to uh, push you further back. But more of that later. That's it for me, Doug. I've got one more question, but I, I think I, I'll, uh, I'll wait and let others have a shot. All right, thanks. And Chris, I see your hand again. Uh, did you want to comment on some of those last questions? I wanted to comment on the um, idea of pushing the building up towards the road. I think that that's in keeping with um, creation of a village center. It gives you more of a feeling of when you're walking down the street that you have, you know, um, a building next to you. And we hope that other properties um, to the west as well as to the east will be developed in a way that this feels more like a village center than just a place where you know there's parking in front of buildings and then the buildings are way back i think that's one of the the um the previous plan showed parking in front of the building and the building moved way back so the planning staff as well as i believe the uh, town manager um, was more encouraging to have the building towards the road and the parking behind the building um, so that's where that came from. Thank you. Well, Thank you. I'll continue to argue that, but uh, a little later on. I don't agree with that at all. All right. Uh, Bruce, why don't you take your hand down if you're if you're done for oh, now. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, and on that subject, Jamie, uh, what what is the distance from the, say, from the edge of sidewalk back to the building? If you bear with me here for just uh, one moment. tell you I'm, I'm looking it up right now and I think it's I think it's on the order of um, what the uh, what the, the current setback is or um, right which I want to say is either 10 or 15 feet but Hold on one moment and I will um, pick up pick the plans here. Yeah, it looks like it it, it ranges, but right around eleven feet from me from the what 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 amount? I couldn't quite hear you. 11 feet from the um, front 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 property line. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jesse, you are next. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had two questions, comments also. One was exactly the same. I was wondering why I was so close to the road. I was imagining that for those apartments, it would be nicer for them to be pushed back as well. Uh, but sounds like there might be more conversation about that later. So I'll move on to my second question, which had to do with, um, can you flip back to the income distribution slide you, you had? Mm -hmm. And really, it may be a premature question, but I'm, I was wondering how that split between the two sites and will it be an equal mix at both properties? Like like of the distribution, or is that too early to think about? Um. Well, that is, um. Yeah, it is. It's split up. I will say that the ten market rate units are going to be at the thirty-one um, Southeast Street site due to the um, income restrictions that are placed on the Belcher Town Road site as it was um, purchased for affordable housing. So the market rate units will be at um, thirty-one Southeast Street. However, the and uh, there will be a mix of um, sixty, fifty, and thirties um, at that at that site. And then with with I believe some eighties, but we we kind of those numbers sort of uh, you know move around a little bit. But this is this this depicts what they are kind of overall. Um, and I'd be happy to you know send you kind of what the preliminary um, mix is. But but there are um, I'd have to check to see to make sure that there's eighty percent um, AMI units at East Street site, but. That I will say that the all the market rate units are at East Street site, and then there's a mix I know of 60s and and um, 50s and 30s as well. So, okay, thank you. That's fine. Enough. Yeah. Okay. So Jamie, on that subject, um, 
does the designation of units uh, is that fixed at the time of uh, the opening of the project? Like, you know, if if a, if a unit is a market rate unit on day one, is it always a market rate unit? Is a, if a unit is a thirty percent AMI unit on day one, is it always a thirty percent, or does is there some flexibility uh, over time? Uh, my understanding is that the the income restrictions are 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 put in place from the start of it and uh, and it will maintain that and this these um these properties are are through a 99 year lease with the um with the town of Amherst is how um wayfinders will be gaining site control of the properties to construct it and um for that for that period it will be um they will be income restricted as 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 they are um you know initially um, okay, so in that sense, uh, or in that case, you know, is the 30% AMI unit a great deal smaller than an 80% AMI unit? I mean, if I looked at a floor plan, could I figure out which ones were for smaller rents and which ones were for bigger rents? Uh, uh, no, you couldn't. And that's actually one of um, Wayfinder's uh, design standards that we try to do is to keep all the units um, uh, almost exactly exactly the same if we can. So there isn't that, you know, difference between a 30% AMI unit or a market rate unit or a, you know, a 60% unit or an 80% unit. The only units that are any larger are the um, ADA uh, accessible units that um that that need to be larger just due to the um you know the uh the the area um you know additional area that's provided for uh residents for their um for, for movements okay thank you uh janet thank you thank you um i have a few questions and some comments um one of the things that we were talking about when we were looking at the um, new fort river school was the question of access from on this project and some of the other residences on the West um, to Fort River. And so I know that's gonna be kind of worked out later, but have you given some thoughts about how kids can safely walk across that that street to get there? Or um, is that part well, of it? The... Yeah, there is a sidewalk on Southeast Street here, and then there's a crosswalk here. Is that? So you were thinking kids would go to the north and then cross at the crosswalk and not just go across the common and try to get to school. Is that? Well, I'm, I'm saying that there is a, there is a, a path that's provided. There is a, a sidewalk provided and a crosswalk here. Um, it, as far as in the school is over in this area, correct? Is that? Um, it's actually, um, it's going to be further south. You see where the whole parking lot is for the school? It's going to be south of that. So, oh, okay. So, and then there's going to be a driveway access where it's kind of hard to see. There's just like a gray, long gray building kind of to the bottom of your thing. And that's that's going to be where the, the school is going to be adjacent to that. And so I wonder if, if people are going to kind of go south and try to cross to get there instead of making a big loop. So, um, Maybe I, maybe this is suggesting that um, you guys talk to the Fort River school people and stuff like that because they're doing some kind of maybe Chris can help out. They're doing some kind of traffic analysis and trying to figure out how people are going to move around. So I think um, I could just see instinctively kids or families wanting to walk to the south and cross over the common to get to school like as quickly as possible because as we know often children aren't really leaving early you know, <laughs> and stuff so i i think i just want to tag that as a future issue um the other question i had is i would assume people who use that field are either living around there or might drive and park there and use the field to play like soccer games and things like that so if people wanted to use that field would they be able to park in the spaces or is that or they would have to park along the common. Has thought been given to that? Um, yeah, my understanding is that if uh, if there was if if people were to access the field, that that they would have to uh, look for public parking. Okay. The other thing I want to say in the beginning is 
it's really nice to see this project moving forward. I remember hearing about this in housing trust meetings. I, I, I want to say five years ago, could it easily be eight? Um, and I know how much effort this takes. I thought, you know, I, I thought the appearance of the um, Southeast Street School, like, did a really nice job of fitting into the houses around there, which are mostly white for some New England reason. Um, and, you know, had the peak roofs and kind of colonial style. I love the fact that you're saving the Southeast Street School, because I think that's kind of a cool building. Um, unfortunately, when I looked at the Belgertown building, I just... I just, all I could think of was the phrase, it's singularly unattractive. It it doesn't seem to fit any kind of New England style. It seems like too close to the road, very generic looking kind of, it doesn't look like a barn. It doesn't look like anything in the area. And that is actually one of the criteria for um, a special permit is that, you know, the project does not create disharmony with respect to the use, scale, and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity. And I just, I just, I just, you know, I went on the website of the um, architects and, you know, Cranberry Manor and Carpenter's Glen look in East Taunton look great. Olympia Oaks looks great. A lot of the low income housing in the area is really well designed. And I felt like this wasn't up to that standard. And I wondered um, if it was moved back, if the building was actually maybe taller, but had some peaked roofs and kind of a more New England style it would not only look better as you in, for the people in the neighborhood, but also for the people in the building. And I'm afraid that this is gonna be seen as so unattractive that people aren't gonna be supporting low income housing in our town. Like, you know, I, 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 you know, the project that you built on Main Street in Northampton, people think is fantastic. And I just don't think this is up to that standard. And so I really would hope for some more design that would fit into the, neighborhood more and look more New Englandy, or if it was going to be looking like a barn that it looked like a barn <laughs> it just doesn't it doesn't I don't know I just I just I felt like that was really just not a very attractive building that I don't think I want to live in and doesn't really fit into the neighborhood which is you know kind of harsh to say but I just feel like someone has to say that well, right. we're, well, we're here for comments, so so I, I I appreciate you know I appreciate the comments, and I can definitely relay that information back to uh, our, our our architect as well. I also thought wondered why the roof on the kind of big bulky gray part, if it seemed like it should be slanting the other way to catch more catch more solar, but I might I'm not you know I might be missing something, but I think that's facing north facing, but I I would I would wouldn't mind more height with more detail and then maybe that would shrink the the physical size of it or it could move it back more. Okay, Janet, uh, thank you. And we'll move on to Fred. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a couple of things. One, uh, Janet made a great point about with the new the location for the new uh, school building on Southeast Street, uh, the uh, the pedestrian traffic is going to be well to the uh, south of the existing crosswalk at uh, Main Street. And but the thing is, I th I think it'd be so much to the south. I think it's actually where uh, the uh, uh, that uh, extension at the uh, south end of uh, the town commons where the 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 road that runs on the uh, west side of that common uh, curves and go and rejoins southeast street proper and uh, so there is actually a logical place for a crossing that would lead directly to the new school building so there, there may be a very simple fix to, to that issue. Now, um, uh, the uh, I do want to comment on the amount of parking. Uh, I think, uh, particularly on Southeast Street, I think the amount of parking there is completely unrealistic. And you've got that large... Uh, piece of property there. Uh, I understand that you got some 
uh, pushback from uh, the town because of uh, wetlands that probably isn't actually a wetlands that probably won't be wet when the culvert's fixed. Um, but I think a fair portion of the uh, north end of that uh, should be additional parking for the uh, for the building. I uh, I think it's magical thinking to think people are going to want to be there and and not be able to park a, a vehicle there. Um, and regarding Beltertown Road, uh, I'm a hundred percent with Bruce Coldham on that one. Uh, that building again. This is magical thinking on the part of some people in the town, I guess, that think that, uh, okay, uh, if we if we put this up there, you know, this close to the, uh, the setback, that uh, somehow we will magically create uh, compatible construction uh, all, all the way around on either side, you know, uh, and I think that's just not going to happen. Um, I, uh, and, uh, I, I think the building should go back and, and, uh, as Janet said, there's, uh, solid support in the zoning bylaw for something that is more consonant with the, uh, the prevailing construction. I, I think this is asking for trouble. Um, and it looked to me that the, I like the idea of the parking in the rear, and it looked to me like there's room to move the whole thing back and uh, and not disturb that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Fred. Thank you. And can I just make one um, one correction? Um, I, I believe I misspoke earlier about the, the distance to the, to the setback there. I, I was just double checking the, the plans and I realized that it was on the order of uh, approximately 20 feet from the property line. The, the 10 feet was the East Street, or the 11 feet was the East Street School was a little bit, a little bit closer. So just, right. I just want to correct myself. My so 20, 20 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bruce, I guess we're back to you. Okay, a couple more things. First of all, just further to Fred on the school, uh, the East Street School site and the parking. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I agree with him or not, or whether others, but it's possible that uh, more parking could be asked for. And uh, and as Chris has pointed out, that there's a culvert that's created the wetland problem, if that's uh, is essentially accurate. Uh, I would uh, uh, here, I think, uh, urge the town, uh, who I guess it's the town who owns this parcel, um, or whoever does, to unblock that culvert uh, more or less immediately, because you can, uh, you know, the, 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 the parcel can revert to non-wetlands uh, gradually, but it's gradual. And if uh, so, it would be, uh, if it were done now, you would have three or four years for the, for the, uh, for the, for the, the, the wet areas to gradually uh, become de uh, formally and, and uh, uh, um, not so. So I think that in order to give the possibility for a little more parking to exist on that parcel, uh, moving expeditiously to unblock that culvert would be a, a, a good proactive uh, um, strategy. Um, but uh, what I really want to do is to uh, to refute uh, uh, Chris's, uh, um, well, I'm not to refute it, to actually uh, speak as powerfully and, and, and compellingly as I can uh, against the logic that's apparently being put forward by town officials, whether it's the town manager or the Paul, uh, 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 Rob Mora or whoever it is, um, as Fred used the word magical thinking, I think that's a pretty good one. Um, the idea that you can make this place villagey along, it, it's it's a main road. It's a, it's a state road. It's the main road into Amherst. It's got traffic streaming past it all the time. This is never going to have an intimacy associated with anything vaguely village center, and it's 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 madness. Uh, it's it's idiocy to imagine that uh, uh, that you can uh, you know it's quite 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 analogous to Mr. Canute who tried to demonstrate that he couldn't uh, stop the tide from coming in. Um, it's that level of. Uh, um, 
hubris, I think, that would uh, be associated with the idea that you would push a developer to push something in that location and a building as big and massive as that to imagine that there's going to be some intimacy created uh, when you're 20 foot away from a heavily traffic traveled main road into Amherst with such a, a massive, um, um, bulky, and I agree with Janet, unappealing building. So um, this logic that apparently um, Chris is referring to was uh, applied at the Mill District um, on the uh, Coles Lane side of that development. And once again, up there, we have a built example of the uh, fallacy of this particular uh, endeavor or proposition or wishful thinking. And you've got this wall of uh, four-storiness right up against the street, casting a shadow right across the street. And it's, it's tremendously oppressive and it has the absolute obverse of uh, creating a, an intimate uh, um, sidewalk space. So I probably haven't ever before on this board and maybe hopefully never will have to again make such a, an attempt at a passionate plea for common sense and to, uh, to, to just completely um, dispatch the idea that uh, pushing that building up against the road is anything but a supreme fallacy. Um, okay, that's enough of that. Um, I think uh, further to that, though, I agree with Janet that this, uh, whereas the East Street building is quite nice and in scale and fits well and so forth, and, and, and uh, Wayfinders have done a good job in other places, Olympia Drive and so forth, but that building, as it is proposed here on Belchertown Road, is clunky and awkward, unappealing. It really doesn't have any grace, not, not any grace at all, really. It's, it's formulaic by someone who doesn't understand the formula, I would suggest. And uh, it does risk having the effect of uh, turning people off um, affordable housing. The, the, it'll, 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 it'll give the NIMBYs uh, an extra dose of tonic. And, uh, and that's not a good idea. We don't want to create uh, public affordable housing that people can point to and say, we don't want more of that. That's really a disservice in all sorts of ways. So I would uh, ask that the uh, developer improve the look and feel, uh, the elegance, the grace, the scale, um, um, and intimacy of that building, as well as pushing it back from the road. Um, uh, if we put, as a town, hundreds of thousands of dollars into this building, of course, others will be putting millions, but even for that relatively minor fraction, perhaps, of the total cost, we deserve better. It's our town. It's the entrance to our town. Um, we deserve better, I believe. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Janet? All right, Janet, you're still muted. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I, I can't believe I'm still doing that. How many, four years in. Um, I was going to say maybe the, the the part of the building that's on the street could be, you know, like obviously improved in its appearance, but less big and put, you know, more of an extension in the back or more of like a courtyard um, sort of situation just to make the, it's not so oppressive to the street. The other thing I just wanted to say as a legal issue is that once a wetland is created, you can't kind of uncreate it with um, just by unplugging things. And so, um, I think the town would have to go to the Conservation Commission if it wanted to clear the culvert. There's a there's a legal case um, for um, at in Hadley. Um, I think next to the target, there's a big sump that you know. I think they just didn't clean it enough, and it turned into a wetland. And then there's this court case which basically says it's a wetland. And so, you know, you let it become a wetland, and you can't sort of undo that. And so I think in this situation. You know, the plants, the soil, the wetlands, plants and soils, it's like it's not like we can just clean out. I think it's too late to clean out the culvert and just hope it goes away. And I think the town will have to go to the concom. So we can't look to that area and say, oh, there's more parking there, though it might be more parking depending on where the wetland is. So legal caution. All right. Thanks, Janet. Uh, Johanna, before I call on you, Chris, you've had your hand up. Did, is there anything that's been said you wanted to respond to? 
Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I'm not going to argue about the um, building being close to the road or not, but I wanted to point out two things. One is that um, Belchertown Road is a, is a town road. It's not a state highway. It's a town road all the way to the Belchertown line. So the town has control over what happens along Belchertown Road. And in fact, we have a grant to improve sidewalks and other pedestrian amenities along Belchertown Road. So that's a good thing. Um, the other thing is on the wetland issue, um, the wetland issue on East Street School, um, I'm not saying that it will no longer be a wetland if the culvert is cleared out. Um, the town has gone to speak to Aaron Jacques about uh, actually taking the culvert out and recreating a stream that was once there. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a natural mechanism for draining that uh, area. Um, I'm not promoting a parking lot there, but it could be turned into a place where it would be more usable for children to play. Um, and the town is going to continue to mow it. So I don't think the town has an intent to change it from being a wetland to something else. The town has the intent to return it to a more natural condition where it doesn't have a, um, you know, an unnatural uh, culvert draining it and would have a, a more natural stream. So just those two things. And one more thing is that Nate Malloy is in the audience. I don't know if he's available to speak to you, but um, he was very much a part of the conversation about pulling the building up to the road. And so you may want to hear what he has to say about that. And this was would be in regard to the Belchertown Road site. Thank you. Okay. Um, Pam, maybe you could bring Nate over into the panel. Mm -hmm. And um, Johanna, why don't you go ahead with your comments and then we can hear from Nate. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to hearing from Nate. Um, I have a question and then I have some thoughts. So um, first, my question is with regard to the AMI, I'm just curious what happens if a tenant's income goes up beyond that? Are they grandfathered into that apartment or if they get a more lucrative position or like, do they have to leave their apartment? How does that work? Mm -hmm. um, then on the Beltratown Road project, when I first saw the design, my first thought was this reminds me of some of the developments that have popped up in Northampton where Route 9 meets Cones Street. And it's certainly different from anything that's on Route 9 right now, but I am trying to keep an open mind about it. And I think um, it has the potential to be the start of more of a village center type feel in East Amherst. Um, you know, I'm excited that the sidewalk is going in there. I think the new school is going to have a little bit more of a modern feel as well. So, um, you know, if Jamie is willing, I'd be interested in hearing more and like hearing his reaction to the comments about improving the elegance or the grace um, and what else was considered. But I also, I'm interested in keeping an open mind about this. Um, and then on the Southeast Street um, site, I, I really love the idea of thinking about how this new building integrates into how people walk, bike, you know, around the new school site. So um, I think the town is doing some work around thinking about how those intersections are going to work north and south of, um, you know, at Main Street and at Route 9. If at some point the town could give a briefing to the planning board about what's planned there, um, I think that would be really helpful. That's the end okay. of my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Johanna. Um, and and I can I can speak to the um uh, speak to the uh, the LIHTC, uh questions so over the income restricted units. Once they if they enter in um the LIHTC agreement, they can they can stay there if their if their um their their income um, goes up, they don't have to leave. Um, 
And um, yeah, and, and, and as far as the school, as far, not as the school, but as far as the uh, Belcher Town Road site, I know that we've worked with the architect to, um, you know, have them sort of develop these presentation um, sort of renderings and things like that. And, you know, like to, to, to get a more of a feel for the, for the, for the building, but it is just sort of a, you know, a computer generated rendering. So, um, but yeah, I, I appreciate all the, all the comments and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take that information back to, you know, back to our design team to, to, to discuss further. Okay. Uh, do we have Nate, uh, Nate? Uh, are you with us? And if you if you are, could you uh, maybe give us some thoughts about how you've uh, guided wayfinders on the siting? Yeah, I was just going to share my screen quickly. <clears throat> um, All right, uh, Jamie, you'll have to stop yeah, sharing okay. for a moment. Is that visible for everyone? I was going to do E Street School and then uh, Belcher Town Road. Yep. So this hey, everyone, I'm, I'm Nate Malloy. Yeah, I was listening. Sorry, I was in the car for a bit and then I've been uh, just eating dinner. The um, So at the East Street School site, uh, this whole backfield is considered a wetland. It's it's not developable. It probably won't ever be. And so, you know, the town's idea was to keep this as passive open space for Watson Farms housing here, for Main Street housing, for the neighbors here. So there's uh, open gates in the fence and this is used now for informal recreation, this backfield. And the, intent, the intention is to always use that as as kind of informal passive recreation, uh, maybe picnic areas, you know, it's not going to be used by the rec department as a, as a, you know, regulation size field that hasn't been for a number of years. But the idea is that this is going to be open space in a pocket park for this neighborhood so that you don't have to cross the streets to go to the playgrounds at Fort River. You can, but this basically is like a backyard for this little neighborhood. Um, and then in terms of what's happening with the circulation, we have block grant money, the town's applied board and received a fair amount of block grant money uh, and some other funding to uh, repave Southeast Street, improve the water line and sewer lines on the street, uh, make connections, service connections to the six properties on, on, on this extension here uh, in preparation for this project. And so there's been discussions about, you know, right now it's unregulated parking along the street. And so we've had discussions about, you know, could it become resident permit parking, right? A sticker permit. Uh, for residents of this development, or could there be ways to inc increase parking on the street that would serve uh, this development or some of these, the few residents here? Uh, right now, it could be that anyone can park here and then catch the bus, right? So it might be that, you know, you go down here on a normal day, there's 20 cars parked here, and half of those aren't residents of this neighborhood. They're here because it's free parking and they can catch a bus. And so we're looking at ways to, to address that, uh, you know, in concert with this development. In terms of pedestrian circulation, the idea would be to improve the sidewalks north and south and create a, a better crosswalk here to the south to the main entrance and create a better crosswalk and intersection here so people can go north and come in this way. There's a pedestrian access to the school that'll come down here to the new school. And then there'll also be a pedestrian connection along here to the new school. So that's something that's been, um, you know, is being considered. I, I don't, I won't, um, um, you know, the final designs aren't there yet, but that's something that, you know, we're, the town is looking at and, you know, the block grant money will get us to here, right? It's not going to cross Southeast street, but it'll provide pedestrian sidewalks to the point where there's a new crosswalk on uh, North and South. And then there'll be other funding that would have to address that. Um, you know, the town was really pleased with Wayfinder's design for this site. We stipulated that the East street school needed to be saved. We thought that their new building uh, kind of townhouse style, uh, um, you know, from the front, um, you know, really did that. It, you know, the Historical Commission looked at this this week and they asked about, you know, could the school be more visible? But because this is all wetland in the back here, you know, if you were to maintain a pretty big cone of visibility to the street, you'd really limit the development potential of this site. And so for the town, you know, the benefit is we're reusing the school into six units and we're also getting 30 units of, of new housing here in right in the in the village center. For Belcher Town Road, yeah, the properties are right here. One of the original concepts was parking in front. And honestly, it looked like an office park to have a double loaded parking in front of the building. And so the town staff, and as, as was mentioned, the town manager um, really wanted to bring the building closer. Now, in terms of, you know, is it, a, is it at the right distance now? I mean, that's something I think that could be discussed. So in this aerial image, we could see, you know, 
uh, Southeast Street Commons over here and what the distance is. Granted, this is still part of the right of way. This is kind of a vestige of the historic common down here. But, you know, what is this distance? And, you know, could it be mimicked over here if we want to have some distance from the Belcher Town Road? I mean, Belcher Town Road is busy and loud. And so, um, you know, I think those are some nice comments. I think the issue in terms of the architecture is one that's been brought up before. And I think it's something to investigate. I, I think that the Belcher Town Road um, uh, building could, to me, it's actually the courtyard facing the parking lot is actually more of its front entrance than facing the street. And I think that there could be some, some, you know, some consideration for how, how it faces the street, uh, breaks down massing, roof lines or other things. And so that's something that happened at North Square is something that could uh, happen here. Uh, the town has MassWorks money, block grant money, and other money to redo Belcher Town Road. The idea is to put uh, five foot, six foot sidewalks on both sides of the road. Uh, we'd go to the fullest extent of the right of way. So the sidewalk from where it is now will be pushed into the property by five feet about or whatever it is. That's what the right of way is. So wider sidewalks, uh, bike lanes on both sides of the street. Uh, and really trying to get Belcher Town Road to be, you know, um, kind of multimodal. Uh, the, the the bus stops and Colonial Village will be improved. There'll be a crosswalk here so residents can exit this building and then catch the bus uh, bus stop either way. Route 9 is still too narrow to have an, an in-road bus, bus stop. So um, it's really not, it's been investigated by Public Works and TVTA. But, you know, as Chris mentioned, you know, this is, uh, will be one building through a comprehensive permit. The planning board has been looking at East Street or uh, East Village. And so perhaps in the future, you know, this is a different zoning and, you know, three, four story buildings would be allowed. And so this building would be in better context. But I, I think the idea about what, you know, what does it look like now, I think is a good one. Um, and then, oh, just one last thing about the units. So the units are fixed. Uh, depending on the subsidy, a specific unit may have to stay at a certain AMI, right? So if it gets other subsidies, it might always have to be like a 30% AMI unit. But typically if someone um, in incomes up, if they're 140% of area median income, they uh, they will then no longer be income eligible and that unit won't be considered affordable. They can stay in that unit. And then essentially the next available unit of the same bedroom count has to become the affordable unit. So if someone, if a household in a three bedroom unit, uh, you know, they, they, they're there and uh, the, the earners start making more money and they are no longer income eligible. They're not evicted, but that unit doesn't, you know, no longer is affordable. And then the next bedroom size, when it becomes vacant, has to be marketed as affordable. And so that's typically how these developments will work. Uh, we don't necessarily call them floating units, but, you know, it's the idea is that when, when it's designated, there'll be the proportional mix of one, twos and threes or whatever it is in the income limits. And then in the future, it could move a little bit. So, you know, if if you know unit 212 is affordable, it might not be affordable in 10 years, but a comparable unit would be, and it would still have the same unit mix. You'd still have the same number of one, twos, and three bedrooms at those income levels, uh, but it may not be the same you know units in for each floor plan. I don't know if there's anything else you want me to touch on or well, we we you. You can say what you needed to say right now. And, and I, I know I have a few comments. And then if you want to comment further, that'll be an opportunity. Sure. Um, so I, I will uh, offer a few comments. It looks like everybody else has had their, their say. Um, first of all, on the uh, Southeast Street property, um, I was disappointed that the old school is partially obscured um, in, in a way that doesn't look very intentional. It just looks like the front building just sort of ended partway across the old building. And, um, you know, I guess I, I, if you haven't thought about turning a corner with the new building and so that it's an L shape and, and connects to the old building on the, on the north side of the uh, old existing building, I would encourage you to look at that because I suspect you could get a couple of additional units by turning the corner there that would replace shortening the building and moving the end of it farther to the north. So, you know, that was disappointing. You know, the old school building is not a hugely, hugely attractive building. 
uh, it's charming in its own way, but it's not a, a an architectural monument. Um, so you know that's not a deal breaker for me, but it it did look sort of unplanned, I guess I could say. Um, second of all, the we didn't see any floor plans for the 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 Southeast Street building, but you know it's it sort of and the rendering didn't really tell me, but I, it looks like there really aren't any unit doors on the east side of that building facing the street. And so, you know, what kind of residential building is that, that, that doesn't have any front doors facing the street, especially on that, in that setting, on that common? So I would encourage you to have some units on the first floor of that unit of that building that face the street. Uh, maybe the, the units upstairs do something else. Uh, you know, maybe they're accessed from the lobby on the back and you go upstairs and down the hallway. But um, it didn't seem like a very urban, uh, a very appropriate solution response to that context. Um, next, um, I guess I wondered uh, I, whether you thought about having a, an additional story on the building. You know, there, there seems to be a pressing need for additional units in this town uh, that are affordable. And could you put another story on the unit, on the building and keep it relatively contextual? I think that would be worth at least considering. Although maybe maybe we're past that point. All right. So then, moving to the uh, Belchertown Road property, um, I I disagree with Bruce about the absolute uh, fantasy of putting the building <laughs> where it's shown, especially hearing that it's twenty feet back. If it were eleven feet back, I'd have some qualms myself. Um, I think twenty feet is plausible. Um, as long as we're sure that Belchertown Road will never be four lanes. As long as it's two lanes, okay, maybe, I, I mean, I'm open to that. Um, I, 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 but I share Janet's uh, qualms about the architecture. It looks to me like a Holiday Inn. Uh, that brown brick and with a little bit of white trim looks like half a dozen uh, Holiday Inns that I've I've seen and some of which I've stayed at. Um, so I, I think you've really missed it on the architecture. And um, I think if the architecture were better, we'd be less worried about the setback. Um, although yeah, I don't know about Bruce. <laughs> and um, again, you know, you've got a sort of nominal front door on Belchertown Road and um, you know, I can understand, you know, maybe this is a, a larger scale building with in, internal units that are internally accessed. So maybe it doesn't really need to have individual units facing Belchertown Road. But right now it's just, just giving us the very minimum nod to addressing the street. And I wish it were a little more deliberate about that. Um, I guess the, that I think is pretty much everything I was going to say. Um, actually, I was going to just ask about, did you consider putting another story on that building? Um, and maybe I'm the only one in the room who, uh, you know, wants to increase the number of, of affordable units, but uh, particularly on that site, I think I, I could see a fourth story. And, um, you know, we have we, we have talked as a board of, after we finish with University Drive, looking at this stretch of Belchertown Road. And um, I at least envisioned that we would be looking for larger buildings that were relatively close to the road, parking behind or beside or not at all. And um, so to me, this is not out of character with where I think we had where I had envisioned the, that part of town going. Um, so 
Uh, I see Bruce has got his hand up and Chris, you're, you're, you're next. You've got your hand up. I just wanted to encourage you to think about how the ratio of parking to unit would be changed if you added a fourth story. So I'm not saying anything negative about that idea, but that does have repercussions. If you feel that there isn't enough parking on some uh, one or the other of these sites, then adding a fourth story would exacerbate that problem. On the other hand, if you think there's a fine amount of parking and there's bus service, then that wouldn't be a problem. Just right. reminding you of that issue. Okay, well, um, one sort of reference I was thinking about was the the new affordable housing complex on Northampton Road. And uh, my recollection of that site plan was that the amount of parking was not, you know, was pretty minimal there too. And um, so, so what I saw, what I see in these plans doesn't look particularly out of character if it's the same type of, of complex. Um, you know, I know that complex was more, it seemed to be more uh, geared toward people who've been homeless and, and maybe this is their first living unit since they've been homeless. So maybe there's an expectation that fewer of them would have a car, but um, I don't know. Uh, you know, to some degree, I, as, I, I trust wayfinders to know their market and to know how many cars they need uh, as I do with most landlords. Uh, Bruce, is this time for counterpoint? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not at all. No, uh, I'm not interested in having the final words on anything. No, uh, essentially, I uh, two things. I, I agree with uh, Doug, and particularly what you said last about uh, why don't uh, I, I think the message that if we were, you know, if if we were fully supportive, Doug, of, of your suggestion, which I, I think we probably could be argued into, it then gives the developer an opportunity to think. Uh, uh, out of a box or beyond the box that he may think he's in. Um, and so, yes, I think we should uh, um, see whether the developer would prefer uh, two reasons for that. One is that, as I understand, there's already elevators in the building. So that's, uh, that's, that's, so, so why not use them? That's number one. Number two is um, part of the opportunity to improve the elegance or interest or whatever you want to call it uh, particularly of the, uh, uh, well, let's say of the uh, um, uh, Belchertown Road building would maybe uh, to have uh, part of it four-story and part of it two-story, or in other words, to have a, a more dramatic uh, uh, contrast uh, uh, in, in massing and, and having an additional story on part of that building would, uh, would be one uh, architectural um, uh, solution concept for achieving uh, what much, most of us, I think, have been arguing for here, which is a, a more interesting and a more engaging building. Um, finally, back on East Street, simply a question, Jamie. Um, could you bring up the elevation of the rendering? Uh, it's just a, a, something that I saw, which I think I understood. Uh, or it seemed to me as though the roof of the east-facing side of the building, where the rendering is from the east, um, overhangs rather dramatically the um the second story windows uh of that uh, of those of those units and it seemed as though and i think you can even see it in the in the rendered shadowing um is um is pretty dramatic um and and uh it seems as to me as though that roof line uh, comes right out from the face it looks it appears as though it's almost a six foot or a overhang and uh that seems as though those upper story windows are being severely shadowed and i wondered whether that's just something that you haven't got around to thinking about before or whether there's a reason why you've got uh such a um, uh, such a dramatic overhang on that side that's just a, a, a I, I was puzzled when i saw that yeah, and I'm I'm happy to to speak to that. And yeah, that that was discussed, and and we can definitely discuss that further with the architect. One of the reasons was is um how some of these um peaked roofs and valleys come into um 
and how they meet and 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 that sort of thing. So they were they were kind of designed with that that um uh, taking that into account. Um and and one of the reasons I guess there there is a front entrance here, a front entrance door here, and a front entrance door over here. And the units, um, you're right, they 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 open up to a a, a common hallway, and that's the way they're accessed. And one of the um the the reasons for that or or the the idea behind that is that that we're, we're trying to create the units that are that are the same i know that the question came up before as as far as you know these units are similar to these units and and not to have sort of any i guess you know um a, a diff, you know any inequities between the you know the, the residents that might be in a one bedroom on this floor versus that floor or or, or or wherever so the um there is a front entrance right here that the door that you cannot see and then another one here and then around the around the corner here is where that um that um that kind of that courtyard area is and i can uh ooh, sorry Get to the right screen here and then so so there's a there's an entrance here and this is this is sort of where the community room and community area is and and it opens up to this nice nice courtyard um area for for the residents and yes there is a hallway that 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 travels through here and then another another entrance um you know to the street over here and um and then sort of a you know a corridor the the management office and in the corridor to to the elevator that's based here and then here there's 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 six units like pretty much um this is sort of like an elevator lobby area um and then on on both floors and then the the other three units are are across this portion of it so um so so yes there there were you know certain things that were discussed as to how you know in 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 an effort to keep um you know similar sized units of uh, you know with the same amenities for for the you know for for the residents that that was taken into account and um that's that was one of the reasons how we um you know decided to uh, to, to 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 pursue that path all right thanks jamie uh, let's see, board members, any more comments at the moment? I see one hand in the public. Uh, so I'd like to get to that before we break and we are approaching eight o'clock. So Fred. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> regarding Southeast Street, uh, uh, just a, th a thought uh, regarding parking. I, I would uh, try and find as much parking as you can uh, consistent with the, the wetlands situation. Uh, and the reason is that some of these uh, units, of course, are designated as market rate. And I can tell you if, uh, if I were thinking about paying market rate for an apartment in Amherst, I would want to know that I can park uh, a car there. And uh, so I, I think there's, this really needs to be uh, given some more thought. Regarding uh, Southeast Street, I, I agree that there's a, a difference between 11 feet and 20 feet, but uh, I'm not convinced it's really enough. And I think there's been a, I, I'd like to commend uh, particularly uh, Doug's comments about uh, thinking about a fourth story and about the idea of maybe uh, making the that fourth story not everywhere, but use it to provide some visual uh, attractiveness to the the unit. I think uh, I think there's a, a a lot of virtue to those comments, uh, and uh, I still uh, I, I like the parking being behind it, and it looked to me like that uh, uh, the, that could stay behind it and just shift the whole thing a little bit so that it's uh, less of a, uh, uh, a, a visual intrusion on uh, the, uh, you know, the Belchertown Road location. All right. Thanks, Fred. All right, so uh, Pam, I think we'll go to public comment at this point. 
Um, so members of the public, if you want to make a comment on this uh, proposal, this is a good time for you to do that. And at the moment, I see one hand that's been raised for a little while. Uh, Pam, if you could bring Pam Rooney over. And we'll give her three minutes. Welcome, Pam, if you give us your name and your street address. Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I really, I'm very excited by these projects and I am delighted to um, see the project this far along. Um, I completely agree with many, many of the architectural comments that have been made, um, starting with the Southeast Street building. I appreciate the fact that that the roof overhangs. They may be they may be big, but but the roof overhangs um, uh, over at least create some sort of a tier effect on the building to make it a smaller scale. That that characteristic um, was not applied to the Belchertown Road, and the Belchertown Road is also essentially three stories in the front, yet it has a very, very different feel. Uh, it is very boxy. The first thing I thought about when I saw it was North Square. Um, and, and not to say that, so North Square, however, has in its, in its sections of facade has much more of a variety of materials and much more differentiation between segments so that it does not appear like a a just a bland uh, shed. Uh, so I I really appreciate the detailing on Southeast Street. Uh, don't see why that can't be applied in part to the Belchertown Road. Um, I appreciated uh, the idea of having a, a an additional floor makes a lot of sense. Um, if if in fact it could be um, in a sense the a dormer style that faces away from the road. Uh, you get a little additional height, but you don't necessarily have the noise of the traffic and you don't have the visual height that um, might be off-putting to people entering town. Um, I uh, definitely appreciated the comments about setback. So while you were talking earlier about the setback proposed for uh, Belchertown Road, it is a, it is a major road, uh, major traffic. It is very different from Southeast Street, the west side of the common. So I looked at uh, the setback on the Southeast Street building appears to be pretty acceptable within, within the comfort range of some pedestrian walking down that sidewalk. However, on Belchertown Road, I always see people walking from further east coming in toward town or vice versa and so as you were talking, I walked outside and measured the setback on Cottage Street. Cottage Street is a 25 mile an hour road street and the houses on Cottage Street are about 30 feet from the from the edge of sidewalk. Yeah, I mean, uh, excuse me, from the edge nice. of road. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished. So from edge of road to the front of the house is about 30 feet. In that space is a sidewalk but at least it feels like it's set back. Belchertown is a much more, is a much, much busier road. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pam. Are there any other members of the public that wanted to comment at this point? Okay, I don't see any other hands. Uh, Janet? Um, a quick comment. If we're looking at possibly four stories, I would hope that it would be stepped back. And so what's presenting on the street is three stories because that sort of fits the village center vibe. And um, I just think I, I do, and both of these buildings actually back onto basically trees and a farm in one case. And so I think, you know, building an extra story further back would be helpful to housing, but also not, in, if it was stepped back, it wouldn't impose on the street and just seem so big and kind of out of a context. All right, thank you. So, Chris, uh, I think in your in your introduction, you said we had the option of recommending this project. Um, and are we recommending it to town council, or are we recommending it to the state agency that received this application? 
You're recommending it to the state agency. They're looking for comments from the town and they will accept um, individual comments as well as comments from boards and committees, as well as comments from town staff and the town manager. Okay. Um, so Chris, when you've done this before, uh, do you, you know, put together a letter with some of the comments that we've given this evening? Um, you know, kind of the board, I'm imagining something that sort of says the board generally supports the project and can recommend it. However, there were a variety of, of suggestions or concerns raised. And, you know, here's 10 bulleted items that were talked about in the meeting or something like that. That sounds very reasonable. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Nate? Hi, Doug. Yeah, so the, um, <clears throat> the, the town's letter will come through the town manager to the state, and so it doesn't necessarily involve council. Um, and so in the past, what we've done is we've uh, synthesized all the public comments into a cover letter. It could be anywhere from, you know, five to eight pages, and it tries to um, summarize the general themes of comments. So if, for instance, in this one, it's about the architecture, setbacks, parking, and then there's some detail, the planning board could have a separate memo as you just mentioned, that summarizes this discussion. And so the town then will have a cover memo and then it'll include all the public comments received. And so when North Square came through this PEL phase, you know, there was 110 letters that were enclosed with our cover memo, you know, and with East Gables on Northampton Road, say it was like 50 comment letters. And so there's an online form. There's been a few comments submitted through that. There's been a few emails. And so we'll take those all, you know, on like April, 17th, uh, the week before the 22nd, uh, that's a Monday, and staff will start to synthesize and read through and kind of categorize all the comments, including the planning boards, you know, historical missions, housing trusts, and everyone else's. Okay. All right. Um, Bruce. Do we need to uh, formalize this as a motion? In well, which I, case... Yeah, I was thinking that's kind of where I think I'm headed is, is that we you know, I guess if I were to make the motion, it would be something like, you know, I move that the board express its general support for these projects and that we charge Chris to, you know, summarize the conversation this evening with the uh, dominant points of concern and, uh, you know, draft a letter to, it sounds like it goes to the town manager. Um, to uh, to re to uh, record, you know, our Which, support yeah. and our general comments. Or yeah, or to like achieve that. to achieve saying I would simply say so moved, yeah. because uh, uh, that I think is what and and I haven't added that we should uh, uh, like to see the draft before it goes because I think we can trust Chris to handle that. But so I would move your uh, motion as you uh, articulated it. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll see if anybody wants to second that. Um, Janet, you're next. Um, I I would. It's kind. Of, I mean, I support these projects. I I I think if it was clear that we panned the set, the Belchertown Road building or had serious concerns about the design and massing, mm -hmm. and wanted to see significant improvements, so it's hard to support something. Like I'm all for this project and I've, I've been for it for five or eight years i can't remember but it's that building I, I i can't support that building being built and i would love to see something go there so i don't know if you can convey that uh um we i think that what doug has said is there's num num numbers uh, of this concerns maybe we should say and our support is conditional upon the resolution of of at least some of those concerns Right. We don't have to. We, I, that makes it non-specific. I think that's probably helpful because then we could have a, a, a quite a long discussion about where the consensus is on what we concern. Because clearly, I've got some things that are more important to me, and Doug's got some for him, and you've got and Fred, and we've all expressed things with different levels of concern, and some of them rise to the point where, as I said, I don't think affordable housing should be tarred with a particular type of brush, and so obviously. Uh, my 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 expression of support falls short of uh, 
uh, uh, just a little short of that, but I think that uh, the, the the applicant is here to uh, hear what we have to say. We know the this applicant is not somebody who's just arrived in town or in the in the in the region. I think we can trust that they will take what we've said. I think that our support, conditional upon resolution of some or all of the concerns, would be uh, a reasonable way of proceeding. I, so I I could guess we could amend the motion slightly to that effect if you like, but. Uh, I, I will second your original motion with amendments if that's procedurally okay. <laughs> I'm not friendly sure. Amend. Well, yes, you can, you can take friendly. I'll take those friendly amendments uh, to Doug's uh, your own. Uh, Doug's verbalization. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's between you and recording. Chris is, yeah. is going to need to <laughs> listen to the recording. Um, Chris, your hand was up, and did you want to say something? I know Nate's is up too. Well, I just wanted to mention that this project will come back to you when it is more finely designed. You know, this is really a first pass and it's really at the conceptual level. So I think um, it was really great that you made all these comments and we'll try to incorporate them all. But what you're doing really is just giving the project a general um, vote of support, in my opinion, with okay. um, with concerns listed. All right. I basically think we, we we've supported it by spending an hour and a half talking about it. If we didn't support <laughs> it, we wouldn't have spent this long. All right. Uh, let's see. I see Nate and Fred. So Nate, why don't you go next, and then we'll go to Fred. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Fred, for your patience. Yeah, I was going to say that at this phase, uh, you know, the state looks at is the site generally developable, is the concept plan generally appropriate. You know, it does their pro forma budget uh you know is it financially feasible so it's kind of these general it's like seven to ten or whatever kind of general criteria uh, and so you know the specifics right now are can be important so i think you know um and like chris said they'll have a chance you'll have a chance to look at it again so i think these comments are great and the state often will then reference back in their letter saying yes this project is eligible but please bring back you know uh, new designs or ideas for the ZBA that relate to some of these comments. And so if, if you know, parking and architecture are big concerns, we can note that in the town's memo and then uh, the ZBA and the, the state may also recognize that. And so I think, you know, generally it sounds like, yeah, we're okay with the, you know, the number of units, the size of the building is, you know, then kind of how do we uh, manage it and make it so it's say it better fits what we want that the, the contextual part of it. And so, you know, that's getting a little more detail than this, the project eligibility phase. But I, I think that's, it's fine to have that and to know where we're going. Um, yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's all I was going to say is that the state will often then, you know, take those major comments and then put them back on the ZBA. And then any comments made during the project eligibility phase will be submitted to the ZBA. So even if the planning board looks at it again, all the comment letters and everything that were discussed during this 30 day comment period gets forwarded to the ZBA so they look at it um, as well. So they, it gets resubmitted as formal comments when it gets to the comprehensive permit phase. So people don't have to resubmit everything twice. We just bundle it and make it one of the first comments sent to the ZBA so they'll see it all again. All right, thanks, Nate. Fred. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm good with all of that. I'm. Am I understanding that the uh, there's a I mean, the devil in these things is always, of course, in the details. Um, Chris, do I did I understand that we would get a look at the letter before it actually goes out? Um, yeah, we we would we would ask that. Yes, I can um, draft the letter and send it out to you all. You'd have to respond individually um, to me, um, and the alternative is to have it brought to your. Uh, April 17th meeting. Um, Nate, would that be too late? It looks like that would be fine. So we could bring it to your April 17th meeting and you'd have another chance to look at it. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then uh, I'm comfortable going forward. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so we have a sort of a motion had, that was post, that was put forward and amended. And uh, a second, do people feel clear enough about the, the motion to 
have a little roll call vote about your support for that. Okay. All right. So uh, why don't we just run through the through the board here and uh, see if you guys are in support of a uh, of Chris drafting a letter that she can either send to us or include in the packet for the next meeting that uh, expresses our general support. Uh, kind of conditional on addressing some major, you know, some sort of the major concerns that were expressed this evening. So, uh, Bruce. I approve. Uh, Fred. I approve. Jesse. I approve. Janet. I approve. Johanna. I. Karen. I approve. And I'm an I as well. That's a unanimous vote of support. Uh, Jamie, thanks for coming and putting up with an hour and a half of not all, not entirely positive comments, but you, you kind of have a preview of what we're thinking about when you come back. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate every, you know, all the time that we've taken to discuss this and, 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 you know, I thank you all for, for your comments and. All right. Good I luck. And we'll see you thank soon. You. Okay. Time is 818. Why don't we take a five minute break and we'll come back at 823. Please turn off your camera and mute your microphone. And when you return, turn on your camera at least.
All right, uh, my clock is showing 824. Looks like board members are returning. And we can move on Doug, I'm here, but... agenda for this evening. Oh, Doug, I'm gonna keep my screen off for a few minutes, but I'm here. Okay. All right, we'll wait for Fred to get back. Here's Fred. Okay, all board members are back. I see Chris and Pam. So we'll go ahead and do the intro for the next item on the agenda. Time now is 825. And we are going to item four on the agenda, a joint public hearing with a site plan review and special permit. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, Chapter 40A, this joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This public hearing is continued from March 6th and March 20th, both in 2024. It's site plan review 2024-05 and special permit, <laughs> excuse me, 2024-04, South Pleasant Street, LLC, 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street. <clears throat> so joint public hearing to request site plan review approval under section 3.325 of the zoning bylaw to redevelop a mixed use building, including rehabilitating the existing mercantile building also known as the Hastings Building, removing a rear L of that building and the adjacent Brown Building, and constructing a new five-story residential building at the new, at the rear of the site, a project to contain 22 dwelling units in combination with ground floor, retail and commercial space, and a connecting structure containing a lobby, an elevator, a stair and, and a stair, and to request a special permit in accordance with section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to allow a reduction in non-conforming lot coverage from 100% to 97% and to relocate the non-conforming retaining wall and section 5.171 of the zoning bylaw to allow payment in lieu of affordable units. The property located on map 14A parcels 250 and 281 in the BG, TC and DR and MPD zoning districts. Board members, are there any disclosures at this time for this project? I see no hands. All right, um, it looks like Chris, you've got your hand up. You got something you wanna say before we turn it over to Tom and his team. Yes, I would like to say something. Um, so on March 20th, um, you held a continued public hearing that was continued from March 6, but you didn't take any testimony. Um, so I wanted to remind the board of that. So um, that essentially, that meeting doesn't count in terms of public hearing process. Um, I wanted to note that Jesse Major and Fred Hartwell um, missed the March 6th uh, session of the public hearing. And I heard from Fred uh, via email that he had watched the um, <clears throat> video from March 6th and felt that he was eligible to vote. And I think Pam reached out to Jesse, and I'm not sure um, if she got a response. So I just wanted to clear that up before we started so we would know who was going to be voting tonight. Okay, Jesse? Yeah, so I, I watched the videos. I did catch up on the meetings. Apologies, I didn't reply. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Chris, thanks for that. And um, I guess at this point, Tom, welcome back. Thanks for having us. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of South Pleasant Street LLC. And its application, as the chairman mentioned, site plan review and two special permits for 4555 South Pleasant Street in Amherst. With me this evening, uh, Barry Roberts, the developer, and Jonathan Salvan from Kuhn Riddle, who's the um, architect. And so last we were here, March 6th, we got 
um, I, th I think a very good reception of the project and we got some uh, very good comments from the board. Uh, we went back to the drawing board. We were prepared for the March 20th meeting, um, but uh, measure twice, cut once. And so we're now here before you. Um, also in the interim, we did appear in front of the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust, Affordable Housing Trust, and they unanimous, unanimously recommended that uh, or supported the planning board's issuance of a special permit for payment in lieu of those uh, affordable units. And so what I will do now is take you through some of the changes. Um, if you've seen the plans, and I also sent an email to uh, Chris that outlined what those changes have been since the 6th prior to the 20th and then subsequent to the 20th. Um, I, think, I think maybe the 25th, 26th is when we sent in just a final iteration of the plan based on some back and forth with the town. We'll go through those comments uh, and plan changes, the, the biggest of which is going to be that entry plaza. So I'll go through the other ones first, and then I'll let Jonathan talk about the entry plaza because that initially got the most feedback from the board. Um, and so with that, I will share my screen and walk you through some of the site changes. Okay, so if you uh, see my screen, it should be a, an updated grading plan, and, and these are really the um, site plan changes. If you're familiar, or if you recall, we only were planning to use this catch basin to collect all the drainage on site. What we've done is added a trench drain in this area here, and so trench drains are much just much more effective at, at capturing any water and, and runoff. And so this is gonna capture all of what's coming around the corner and it's being piped down to this catch basin. Uh, we, we also got a letter from Jason Skeels who wanted us to put in a deep sump hooded catch basin with a shallow top, which we've agreed to do. And so that's what this, um, it's, the, it's in the existing location, but it's being replaced. Um, and then we also uh, extended the limit of work to accurately show what that limit would be. And so it includes this bump out here. We had some utility penetrations earlier, but now that limit of work, as you'll see, actually takes all of this bumped out area, including that tactile warning strip. Um, additionally, on each side, and I think this was, uh, Corinne had made a comment about folks entering and exiting and folks um, at this intersection walking across that uh, right of way, we've added tactile warning strips on each side of this access way as well. Uh, not shown on this plan, shown on the utility plan, but instead of switching pages, we're putting a, uh, a water line into the landscape area just so that there is, in fact, irrigation. And on the erosion and sediment control plan, uh, we, we have a fence that's um, keeping the right of way here uh, open. And on the um, northerly side of that, we're proposing straw wattle. So some erosion, extra erosion and sediment controls um, for uh, during the construction. And so one of the other uh, changes you'll see, and I'll let Jonathan really talk about it, but besides this entry plaza generally um, is this entryway right here. And we're proposing two granite steps as, uh, along with a railing and the railing does come out a, a small bit into the uh, public way, the sidewalk, but that's necessary given the ADA access requirements. And Jonathan can talk about that a little bit more. Um, I will then go to the architectural plans. And so what you see here is that entry plaza that that Jonathan will talk about, um, but I'll skip past that just at this time and go on to, there is a request for a slide that shows uh, or confirms that the commercial space is at least 30%. This blue area is that commercial space and the green area is the residential space. 
we've got a calculation down at the bottom showing that that ground floor area of the commercial space is 42.2% of that entire first floor floor area. Uh, what we've also got is the EV charger shown on the, the back of this support. Um, instead of putting it here where it could interfere with the ADA access, uh, we've cited it on this side. And then also we've got a, a six foot high metal screening fence, which we can show you what that looks like. This is to screen some HVAC equipment for um, this existing site. There was also a comment uh, about the electrical meter meters. And so this is, you can see over here, this is the north side. So Amherst Cinema is to my right. Electrical meters there, not shown in this rendering, but shown here. That's where that metal screening is going to be for the HVAC uh, equipment. And then we also updated the, the management plan just to show exactly the number of total units that we were having in it, their breakdown, uh, identify the use of those two parking spaces that we showed before, one at ADA and then one really for loading um, and drop off uh, unloading. We added a tenant move in uh, logistics plan and also a parking and alternative transportation plan which would be given to the tenants, which shows town parking, PVTA bus routes, bike paths, et cetera. We can get into that if anybody has any questions. And then I think it was Bruce comment, Bruce's comments last time to maybe update the lease to include that information, which we've done. And I know that Fred in his email had some additional lease changes. We're happy to make those changes. We haven't yet, but we're happy to make those changes that he had suggested. Um, and I think with that, I'll turn it over to Jonathan to talk about the the entry plaza. If anybody has any questions on those, ask now. You know, we're not going anywhere, so we're we're happy to answer them at any time. Um, but I'll turn it over to Jonathan to talk about the entry plaza. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so you know, we had some uh, good uh, feedback at the last meeting where we were all present. Um, that talked about uh, expanding the area potential for seating um, as part of the entry plaza, also trying to open it up a bit. Our, our sign was kind of perceived as, as, a, as a visual block. Yes, Tom, if you can move down to the, the more detailed ones, thank you. Um, uh, and, you know, asked us to look at maybe some lower plantings that didn't uh, kind of make a, a, a visual wall. Um, and so we've responded to those. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, get your uh, feedback tonight on on that. Um, again, I guess I'd start with that that location that Tom had mentioned earlier, uh, connecting our pathway directly to the public sidewalk. Um, the way it comes in on the, that rather steeply uh, graded part of the uh, public sidewalk requires us to put a couple steps in, um, and you can see the two uh, handrails there that that Tom was referencing earlier. But adjacent to that um, is a seat wall that will vary in height and vary in texture uh, with combination of sort of large concrete or not <laughs> large granite blocks and some kind of laid up or masonry uh, laid up uh, sections as well. Um, Tom, could you pan to the right so we can kind of see it from the other angle there? Kind of from, from back on the site, looking back towards the street um, and I, I guess I probably should have prefaced this with one of the big changes we made uh, here and, and is to take the L-shaped uh, ramp that we had and turn it into a more of a V or a U-shaped um, arrangement. And that that allowed us to kind of it freed up some some area to do some different things with that. Tom, why don't we move back to one of the one of the plans? I think I there we go. I may be moving too fast here. And go back to the plan and just yeah. make sure we hit the hit the basics here. Um, you you probably recall that prior to this we had again an L shaped uh, uh, ramp, um, and we're still you know we still have a, what we're going to call a fully accessible pathway that comes along the street at the at the uh, south end and moves up this now V shaped ramp, um, but we have this stepped accessible uh, connection. That's kind of a straight path off the off the um, 
off the, the front door sidewalk. We moved the transformer to the back, um, a little further away from the street uh, and, and changed some of the planting around there. I think we had like uh, grasses initially um, and we're showing a, an evergreen now, uh, a, a holly that would you know have all, all season color. Let's see, if we zoom out a little bit and take a look at the, the new signage proposal down there in that lower right. Um, in, instead of a kind of a, a um, monument sign uh, with, with letters applied to them, we're looking at sort of a, a freestanding letter that would be in probably a stainless steel uh, finish. Um, and that's a little bit more open um, and allows us to kind of see back into that, that site better. Um, I, I, I'm certainly at a point where I think I could, people could ask questions if they're, if they're ready to. I think I've hit all the, the major changes um, that we've made since the last time. Yeah, we've also provided um, updated oh, yes. materials. Uh, so we've provided the specs for pavers, uh, bike rack, handrails, and then some examples, examples yeah. right, of what you're talking about with the granite and the, uh, the stone. Okay. And, and we updated that planting plant as well that we had from before. All right. All right. Thanks for addressing the concerns that we've raised last in the last discussion. Uh, board members, questions and comments? Bruce? Um, uh, Tom, um, Barry, uh, Jonathan, yes, I, 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 I commend you. I think you've... Uh, been very diligent in addressing a lot of the things that were said, and 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 I think quite successfully. I, I I'll simply ask one question just for clarification here, because I think you said this in passing last time, but uh, clearly the uh, what you didn't say now, but it's evident from looking at the illustrations there, the wall and the uh, two steps uh, down to the street. Uh, sidewalk um, do extend beyond the face, uh, the current face of the Hastings building. I think you said that uh, although you hadn't taken advantage of uh, this in the last drawing, that the uh, property line actually was a couple of feet out. And so can, do I correctly understand, therefore, that the limit of those uh, handrails is at the limit of your property line? The it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. The edge of our steps and our um plant and uh, bench and planting that is the property line. Um, in, in our uh, discussions with with the building department, it they felt strongly that 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 transition from a from the site, you know, from the the private side of it, as it were, to the public side occur at the property line. Um, but they were okay with the um, handrail sticking in for the extension length um, that uh, that it's supposed to have into the public way. And that, that was looked at by um, both uh, Rob Mora and I believe Jason Steele. Is that correct, Tom? Yeah, I, I think the way to say it is, you know, Bruce, the request was to make the site ADA compliant. And that's what was done. So it, it required... You know, if there was new work being done, like here, we went right to the property line. As a result of that, um, the handrails extended a bit beyond. And so we talked with Jason Skeels, and he had no issue with their extension into that uh, sidewalk. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I don't think I have any problem with that either. And uh, as I say, I, I like the, the risk. I know the, what you, the, the, uh, the way you've, created it now is that you've got more of a walk from the street to the entry and the uh, ramp is really a branching uh, diminutive uh, design element whereas previously the ramp appeared as though it was uh, 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 was was it, it the the it was it's different and I think I like it better this way I, I the seating is 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 nice it's not as uh, salubrious as I had imagined, uh, but I think this is fine. I like the way that it's uh, 
uh, you, there's quite a lot of it because of the way in which you've got the capstones on the walls and people can sit. And I note that uh, the guy with the long legs can sit further to the south um, <laughs> and so forth. So it feels to me, and I think that the I particularly appreciate the way you've made the sign equally conspicuous, maybe more so, but that it's not nearly as... Uh, uh, obstructive, and I didn't even really have a, so much of a problem with it before as obstructive. But uh, but now that I see what you've done here, I I think it's uh, it is a it is a definite improvement. So I'm uh, I'm a I'm a happy camper. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bruce. Janet, I I also like this design a lot better. I like that the transformer isn't kind of in the middle of everything and tucked away, and I think the plantings are more attractive. Um, I like the the sign with the letters. I wondered if that the sort of seat the wall that curves around if it could if it could stay wide so it's still it's still attractive and more inviting to sit and I could see people kind of kids kind of curving around that. So I just wondered if that could be the same width all around. I also was thinking about the EV charging for bicycles. I don't know if you're planning on having EV charging in the um, indoor bike stuff, but I wondered if you could do an EV charger as part of the um, charging for the cars. Like, I don't know if you can do that. It seems like these EV chargers aren't going to be super used. So I wonder if that might be a, a good tweak so people could charge outside and things like that. Um, so I, I do think this was really much, you know, more elegant and attractive and, you know, really answer our concerns. And I think it's going to be really, really nice. A good ad. All right. Thanks, Janet. Um, I don't see any other hands from other board members, so I'll put in a couple of comments. One is I, I am in agreement with Bruce and Janet. This looks much better, and I, I think it looks really good. So um, in general, I think this, this, is, this is where it should be. I guess one thing that I'm just wondering about that seems more evident than it did before the canopy or the awning that's covering the walkway, is there downlighting in that so that it, it uh, at night that's going to be a well illuminated area that I'm comfortable walking down? And, yes. um, yep. and, and is it probably illuminated enough that it isn't going to attract people who are trying to get a good night's sleep outside? <laughs> Well, we, 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 we like to think that we'll, we will manage that last part as well. Uh, I believe in this set, we have an updated photometric. Did that make it into this? this it's round not round? in this one, Jonathan, but I can, okay. I can pull it up if That's you want. That's fine. To... I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't need to see how many foot candles you've got. I, <laughs> I expect you'll have enough, but, uh, you know, you, I, that, that awning feels like an optional element. You know, you could have people keep their umbrella up for another hundred feet as they go to the front door to the building. Um, but, you know, it's a nice touch. So, okay. Yep. There Couldn't help myself, Doug. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So, yeah. So you'll see soffit lighting in here and then the foot candles underneath it. And I, you know, I don't want to put my architect's hat on, but I think as far as design goes, th that awning goes a long way to separating but also joining both buildings, you know, so you've got the front building with the, the, in earnest three stories, the back building with a, a faux three stories because of the way they've designed it elevator piece. And, and this ties it in, but also separates it. So. Okay. If it's well lit. I'll, I'll invite you to my next review. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, that response. Uh, we'll move on to Karen. Um, so the the seating is basically this wall and the people are going to be kind of sitting facing the outside the street. Is is that right? Is that? Yes, I mean, I think you'd have the ability to really to sit. The intent is to be able to sit along that whole kind of outer circuit. So the first, you know, piece that kind of uh, faces the street allows you to face the street. You could continue to sit on the other parts of that. Uh, fall the access drive, um, but I think the view is going to be more attractive towards the towards the common. Yeah, is there any way that you can have also seating? So I don't know. Is is there a possibility of having 
some way that people could face each other that you have a little congregation or is it shouldn't be just is that impossible i think we I would end up having to lose planted area to do that i'm afraid right yeah okay i i like it i guess i pictured in my head i always sort of picture congregating in a in a group across from each other and but this is also nice. Thank you for all your work. Okay, thanks, Karen. Fred? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I strongly support this. Um, there was a, <clears throat> a comment made at the uh, prior meeting, uh, which I watched online. Uh, from Vince O'Connor, which uh, intrigued me. And uh, uh, he indicated a potential problem with four bedroom apartments turning into some kind of a rooming house situation. I tend to think that that is a management issue and I don't think we have a management problem uh, in this instance, but uh, I would be curious if uh, uh, town staff or, or if anyone has any additional comments that uh, uh, that address that comment from Vince. It was uh, it intrigued me. Uh, it's not something I had heard before, and I, I, so I'd be curious. Um... I confess I'm having a hard time remembering the specific comment, but you're, Fred, you're saying that it was uh, concerning the four bedroom units and whether they pose any sort of management issue or public safety or nuisance issue? That's that's the way I understood. He, he made two comments. He, he uh, asked, that uh, we consider uh, rather than the uh, uh, the uh, payment in lieu of uh, affordable units that we insist on in affordable units in other buildings that Mr. Roberts owns. And uh, I think uh, Chris uh, adequately addressed that by pointing out that all of those units have been subject to uh, town proceedings in various ways and you there's no way to reopen those uh accordingly and uh so i think uh that has been fully addressed the second comment he made was and i it, it, from memory it was about mostly on four bedroom units and uh whether they end up becoming some kind of a rooming house and i'd never heard that before and I'm just curious whether there was uh, Vince tends to know a great deal about these things and so I'm just curious whether uh, there was any additional response to that oh okay so a rooming house in the sense of maybe renting the bedrooms individually and uh, not yes. renting the unit as a whole yeah, you know, and and that uh, I I took that to mean that if you if you lose control over the 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 use of these apartments, then people come and go, uh, and you lose control over the over the tenancy. I I I don't know for sure, uh, but uh, I I thought it was intriguing. I I've not heard that before, and so I thought I would follow up on it. Okay. Um... Chris, I'll give you a chance to comment if you want, but I think Tom, your lease for this building, uh, would it allow a, a, someone to rent the whole unit and then sublease individual bedrooms or something? I'd have to look, I, I haven't considered that that situation is a potential. I mean, I think typically, landlords like to maintain as much control as they can. And so sublet and assignment are usually 
not allowed unless specifically allowed. Right. I'd have to look at the lease to see exactly what it says, but that's traditionally how we approach these is it's not allowed unless the landlord specifically allows it. So you retain that control and that uh, ability to say, no, there are some circumstances where a sublet is appropriate, right? If somebody's renting it and they're going away on sabbatical or a semester away, they don't want to be responsible and they want to get somebody else. I can tell you that Barry's had other properties that allow that. So I would imagine practically that's how it's addressed. Okay. And Chris has not raised her hand, so I'll assume that at least she has no comment on that earlier comment. Janet, your hand is up. So I think that maybe Vince's concern is if you're renting by the bed. And so, you know, and so I think the lease is, everybody on the lease is liable for everything. I don't rem I think that's what I read. But I think when you're renting by the bed, it's what's the difference between that and a rooming house? And when we have a rooming house in Amherst, there's somebody who's running the rooming house who lives there. And so if there's nobody living in the four bedroom apartment and people are just kind of coming and going, then it's a rooming house. It's not an apartment, it's a rooming house. And so I think that was maybe what he was thinking about. And it's kind of a good point. I did have once somebody who wanted to rent an apartment I have, and I sent my husband out to meet him. And it turns out he was like, planning on like renting, you know, renting the whole apartment and then renting out to like 10 or 15 people to live there. And which we found to be a very unattractive idea. And we're glad that he was so clueless as to tell us, although I think my neighbors would have told me. So I think that situation, everybody, every landlord would want to avoid. Um, I, a, a situation, this sort of segues into a concern that I had, and I think it could go into a condition, which is, what happens when, if this, you know, there's only 22 units, but there's lots and lots of beds. And so if this building is rented out to 90% or 100% students, it's basically turned into sort of a private student dorm. And I think, um, which is not allowed, except for in this one little tiny part by Olympia Place. But I, I, my concern is that if it is almost exclusively students, bad things happen at night um, in students' lives and on weekends, and I would like to have a condition in the management plan if 90% of the tenants are students that you come back to the planning board and we talk about a supervision plan, which could be on-site supervision 24 seven, having a super who lives in the building, here comes my cat. Um, and I just, I do think that, you know, my fear is that downtown is gonna become like UMassville. And if it does become UMassville that every building is making sure that they're maintaining control over the students. So I, I'd like to see that condition go into the um, into our conditions. All right, thanks, Janet. Tom, do you have any comment on that suggestion? I mean, if Janet wants a condition that says if more than 90% of the units are occupied by students, then um, we'll come back and have a further discussion about a management plan. Yeah, or 90% of the tenants, because there's just a lot of beds there. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's 22 units. I hope I'm not making that All right. up. No, no, you're right. It's 22 okay. units. So, you know, I mean, it could be 90% of the units or 90% of the tenants, you know. Um, it's just that at some point, we need, we need some big people there to make sure people are making good choices and are stopped from bad choices they're making and for their own safety and, you know, all the good, all the reasons we know. So let me think about units versus beds or tenants. Okay. Tom, do you even know whether, I mean, how do you even know if a tenant is a student? You know. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, in terms of their application to. Well, you want to know if somebody has a job or who, what's their income. And you always, you always know when you have students. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you would, I think you would know, you do have to be careful uh, fair housing laws and, and asking the wrong questions. Um, I know that, you know, in other developments, we've done 180 Fearing Street. So at the corner of Fearing and Sunset, we've got um, obligations to identify what the unit breakdown is. And so I think if, if, if Janet is saying, listen, if it's 90% or more that, and of more, we can figure out what that is if it's tenants or units, but if it's 90% or more than uh, of, let's say, undergraduate students, then 
you know, we can come back and have that conversation and say, okay, here, here's what it is. We've, we've reached that threshold and here's our implementation plan. I mean, ideally we don't have to do any of that stuff. Um, but if, if it ultimately gets us the approval this evening, then, you know, we're willing to accept that. Okay. All right. Uh, Fred. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure that we need to do anything with this. Um, as I think the board knows, I've been a landlord for 52 years. <clears throat> and uh, I have very clear and always have had very clear language in my leases that, uh, you know, you uh, collectively are renting an apartment uh, and uh, you're not, you're not renting a bed, you're renting, a, you're, you're, uh, this is a group and you're renting an apartment, uh, period. And uh, uh, the only persons who are permitted in here other than occasional visitors are the people who are on the lease as a tenant. And I have enforced that relentlessly for 52 years. And I haven't had difficulty enforcing it because I make it very clear when I'm interviewing prospective tenants. Um, I, I, you know, and I, I think the language that, I, I did go through the leases pretty carefully, and I think that this is probably uh, clear in the in the leases. But um, uh, if it's not, it should be. All right. Thank you, Fred. Bruce. I think this is one of those situations where when you have an applicant who such as Tom and Barry and uh, 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 demonstrated who are uh, comfortably willing to embrace uh, uh, and, and accept a condition like this, it's because they have the experience and the confidence that they don't need it. Um, and so it is one of those things that if we, if, 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 if you have to argue with the, the person that's probably <laughs> because you actually do need it in this case, the uh, track record of, of, uh, because uh, we we've, we've seen Barry before and 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 his uh, fearing street units that Tom mentioned and so forth we had a similar conversation and I can't remember whether it was in the planning board or I'm also on the uh, as is Karen on the local district district commission and and they were it's not our real uh, bailiwick uh, because our because the local historic district commission always or seems to always get these projects first because people want to make sure that they can get the certificate of appropriateness and then they move on to bigger and better things. Uh, th this conversation happened uh, with Barry's project down there as well. So I, I, I'm uh, of the position that uh, I don't think we need it, but, um, but maybe we could with a, uh, 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 an applicant who's, who's willing to accept it um, um, actually imposes as a condition. And then we have a precedent uh, that we can look to if there are circumstances where we perhaps really do. And it doesn't therefore become a, a, a novel uh, condition that, that indicates that uh, it's not a novel condition that becomes something that is uh, uh, like many of the other conditions that we have on the draft list, uh, something that is um, not unusual. So I'm I'm broadly in support of what uh, um, uh, uh, um, Janet proposes, uh, particularly because uh, Tom is willing to uh, accept it. Tom and Barry are willing to accept it. Thanks, Bruce. Karen, you're next. So I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I shouldn't be mentioning this at all. I keep looking at this plaza, and you know downtown. Look at at Amherst Coffee. How willingly people are sitting, scrunched against that building just to be outside and to sit outside and and enjoy town. And this plaza to me is such an exciting thing. 
and I'm now looking at it and I'm just going to throw this out and you can throw me under the bus if you want. That <laughs> vertical, if you eliminate the plantings in that and make that another sort of bench so that people can also sit there and then that little bit of planting, although I agree green things are beautiful, you just put a couple of pots of flowers there to make it nice then you have a space where there's more possibilities to sit out there. Okay, I thought I'd better say it because I keep staring at it, wondering. Okay, thanks, Karen. Janet? I think it's Jamie's turn, but I was going to jump in and first ask Karen where she's talking about. But also, I think when we think about these conditions, it's not, to me, it's never personal, like who the applicant is it's like 50 years down the road or 25 years or, and people are buying and selling buildings all the time. And to me, it's like that will give the board and the building commissioner authority to come and say, okay, this building is out of control. Let's do have a condition here you're not complying with. And so I think I would love to see this on all the buildings because I think we just need to always have, you know, people in charge and responsible. And it's not always the people we rent to. We also, can't say undergraduates because we can't discriminate on the basis of age unless you're 55 plus and you can favor those people. So we can say students because that's not a protected class. So anyway. Okay, Jesse. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was gonna comment on the idea of this condition also. Uh, well, I don't disagree with the intent. I'm struggling with how we can make that condition and then how that would be implemented and how you define 90% students as you just raised, Janet. Like, it, it, I think that becomes a big logistical nightmare too. Are we then asking the manager to provide the town every six months with an update of the percent students as they define students? I just see a lot of problems with trying to even manage that. Um, so yeah, that just confused me how that could actually happen, I guess. That's all. Okay. Well, uh, Chris, don't we already have a sort of problem building program that if a if a if a property has more than some number of complaints in a certain period of time that they get increased scrutiny from inspectional services and other town departments? I believe that's part of the rental registration program that's being altered. And I don't know if that's been accepted yet. Maybe others know, but I know it's being considered by um, the CRC and the town council. Right. And so, I mean, it seems like we may already have a way to identify and force a conversation with properties that are out of control, uh, at least if they are exhibiting behavior that qualifies as out of control. So I guess I'm I'm not inclined to uh, push a condition like that. Karen? Karen, you are muted still. That's a legacy hand, sorry. Okay. Bruce, uh, you're you're next. Um, to uh, what Jesse was saying, um, am I right in understanding the practical nature of conditions? Is that uh, I don't think a condition such as Janet proposed would manifest itself in a, an annual obligation on the town to check and so forth uh, to make sure that the condition is being complied with. I think it's the kind of condition that is there so that if there's a problem, there's a mechanism with uh, legs or with teeth to deal with it. So I don't think it should necessarily uh, be complicated because it probably, with a, 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 a decent landlord, probably sits there and, uh, and is uh, only enacted or is only pursued if there's a uh, if there's a problem, I certainly wouldn't expect that we are generating uh, by putting these conditions in. 
I hope we're not generating uh, with every condition we put in uh, some kind of annual obligation on the town to check all this stuff. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Chris, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I, I guess I'm trying to imagine how this would um, occur. Are you asking the uh, applicant to report to the town about how many students he has in his building on a on an annual basis or a six month basis? The building commissioner is not going to go looking for that information. He's got many other things to do. So how are you imagining that this would um, be be handled? That's what I'm asking. Yep. Today. Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead, Janet. Uh, so my so when we did the um one of the buildings at Olympia Oaks, one of the building one of the buildings already built has twenty four seven supervision, right? Because it's full of students, and so that condition was also imposed on the new building, which I think actually has a live in person. And so, if if in fact the building becomes 90, 95 percent students, it's effectively a private student dorm, right? Which isn't even allowed in the R B G, but it's there. And my idea would be when you hit that threshold, come back to the planning board and say, here's my management plan. Here's how I'm planning, you know, maybe we say you need to have somebody there 24 seven or one, you know, one of the apartments, there's a super. But I remember Karen saying, you know, she was an RA and things go south very quickly with young people on a weekend. And, you know, people could be drinking, suicidal or whatever. And that's why we have RAs. And so if we're basically having dorms downtown, we need to, acknowledge that and treat it as a safety issue for the people in the building. It's not just out of control people, but just their own safety and making poor decisions. So that was my thinking. And so if the burden would be on Mr. Roberts or whoever the owner is in the future that, you know, I assume there's going to be a mix of people, right? But if it turns into a student dorm, let's, let's come back to the planning board and let's have a discussion saying, okay, now you're running a student dorm downtown we normally require 24 seven someone there because it's a safety issue. That's what I was thinking. I know it's, it might be, seem like springing out of the blue, but truthfully, most of the housing we're approving, you know, we're supposed to, you know, we're developing 800, a thousand units. Most of it is student housing and we're not really regulating it like that. Okay. But Brad. if he's willing to be the, the guinea pig, I say, let's do it. All right, thanks, Janet. Fred? Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear that we need to specify students. Um, I would prefer to do this by a, uh, a, a by reviewing the lease and, um, you know, the, we do get a look at the lease. And, um, you know, uh, I think we just make sure that the lease has the the kind of language in it, which I, I think it does, um, that, uh, that basically prevents the, the kind of out of control turnover that uh, was posited at the prior hearing. All right, Tom. Sure, so maybe I'll try to rein this back in a little bit. Um, I mean, there are mechanisms in place already in town. Should should there be any issues that there are opportunities for enforcement? Uh, in addition, I agree with Fred, right? You, there's a lease, there's a condition in the proposed conditions that says if this lease is changing materially, you've got to come back before us and, and talk to us. And so, I think that plus I I can't get beyond the fact that this is also site plan review. Um, and so we're not talking necessarily special permit zoning board of appeals for the underlying use, right? The underlying use is mixed use, which is site plan review from the planning board. So, you know, when I take all of those pieces together, I think you're sufficiently protected to, to guard against or to correct any issues that may occur should you know because i think if what if it's a 95 percent students and there's not a peep right just because it's it's well managed already right so you're, you're anticipating that well it's students and it must be bad so 
I'm saying, well, we've got a management plan in place. We've got a lease in place. If And then you've got the, the enforcement mechanisms through rental registration, nuisance house, and just we're right across from town hall. So if there are, if there are issues, there are enforcement mechanisms that the, the town can use to make sure that it's run properly. All right, thank you, Tom. Fred? Yeah, just for the record, uh, I uh, currently rent two apartments and uh, they are currently 100% student rentals. Um, and they are not problems. So, um, and partly because of the way I drew the lease, so. Okay. Karen? Well, I think partly they're also not problems because you're living very close to it. And I think our concern is how do we get more families and non-students who also want to live in town and design things that are attractive for them uh, so that we have that mix because really that's what we're fighting. We're fighting having losing our historic town to becoming a kind of a student ghetto and having the downtown part be that. And it doesn't need to be in, in you, you need diversity and you need to build in a way so that people like me will want to rent one of those apartments from Barry and design it in that way. All right, Nate? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that this conversation is, uh, you know, the complementary pieces, the university drive overlay or other places where we actually are talking about density, right? So we're not going to solve the student housing piece on a 22 unit development. And every time there's infill development, if it's all going to be students, we need to say, well, where can we put thousands of beds for students to have developments like this be, um, you know, proportionally not all students. And so I think we're getting stuck on, you know, we talk about University Drive now, we're saying, well, maybe we don't want it to be as dense as it could be, but here's the problem. Every time there's going to be a development now, we're always worried it's going to be students. And so I think we have to start saying, well, what are the other pieces of the conversation and where can we actually allow students in density? And so um, the other piece would be inclusionary zoning. You know, there's ways to say, can we have, um, you, know, I, you know, perhaps a revised inclusionary zoning bylaw to have more units be bigger different income ranges up to maybe 120 or 150 percent ami it's not capital a affordable it's a local enforcement piece but then we get a percentage of units that are non-students so right now it's up to 12 percent of the units what if we said it's up to 20 percent but that 12 to 20 percent is 150 ami or something and we see you know does that actually deter development but otherwise there's really no way to regulate students out of housing I actually think more housing is good housing. And so I feel like we're, you know, we're not going to solve it here. And I think we've had conversations about it. You know, we don't allow off-campus student dormitories except for right in the in the RF district, the fraternity residence district. And so what this is, is market rate housing that may or may not be rented to students. Uh, it's the case for probably any rental or any, you know, opportun housing opportunity in town. I think it's really difficult to regulate end users uh, with zoning, especially with site plan review. So the zoning board will say, you know, 12 month leases, nothing less, no subletting, you know, maybe all, all lessees um, have to be, you know, on the lease at the same time, right? Or something, right? There's certain conditions you could have, but that doesn't, that they still can all be students. I think that it's really difficult to say, you know, these units cannot be students. It could be their parents might rent them then. And then, the, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's just, it's, it seems like we're trying to really, you know, get at something that's really difficult to regulate right now. And so I think we have to start looking at other things when we talk about how do we provide housing for students while we have opportunities elsewhere. And I think we could address that differently than just trying to talk about this development. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Fred, you're next and then Janet. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Uh, I, I think it's a fool's errand to try and say that uh, somehow we're going to uh, limit this uh, and, and address students in this way. Uh, for for one thing, uh, this property uh, necessarily 
by its location essentially has no parking. Uh, you're not going to put uh, families in of an appreciable number of these uh, uh, units uh, without parking. And uh, so the, the, they're going to be students. Uh, the question really is, how are they going to be managed? And they can be managed in a way that uh, is, uh, that, that it will, I think, address the, the problems. But um, I, <laughs> I don't know how we're going to avoid that. OK, thank you. Janet. So I think I think we this conversation has sort of ranged past what I'm what I'm trying to do is I think that when we, I was thinking we need a trigger for when a building becomes effectively a dorm and there's not a functioning experienced adult in the building to take care of the students who might need help. And so you know, it could be 95%, it could be 90%, but that, you know, so, you know, I'm not saying not, I'm not anti-student, I'm actually really pro-student, I want healthy, safe students. And so if your building becomes effectively a dorm, we have been requiring 24-7 supervision. And so, you know, this, this could be encouraging landlords to have a more diverse group of people. I don't know, whatever. But basically, if you're building, I, I've forgotten how I counted all the beds, but I, I couldn't find my notes. So there's like 60 people in the building. They're all, all students. Come back to the planning board and we can say, how are you going to keep these people safe after 11 on a Friday or Saturday night? Like, is there somebody there if something goes south? And so it could be just maybe somebody there for the weekend on weekends, Thursday, I guess Thursday is also now a weekend, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, who's up, who's around taking, you know, making sure things go well, because this has effectively become a student dorm. And so I think this could happen to any building in town. And let me just say, these student rentals are the most lucrative, highest per square foot rentals and I'm just saying it's not a huge burden or it might it may not be necessary. You might have great students that don't drink themselves or have bad decisions. I don't know. I raised two really good kids that made some really crappy decisions. And I was glad that there were people around to kind of help them out. And so I'm just trying to say if we're, if buildings are going to turn into dorms, that basically we have a mechanism. We come back to the planning board. We're like, OK, what's your management plan for the weekend? Is there somebody there on call or present who is going to help with these people? That's it. If you don't think that's important for those students or in that building, but it's not about creating family housing. It's not about inclusion and zoning. It's just saying if, if there's mostly students in the building, they need more than the average bear. And they're also, by the way, paying a lot more than the average family. So let's put some protections in. But if you don't buy it, you don't buy it. I just think it's important. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, I'm going to let you jump jump in front of Bruce. I just wanted to suggest that someone come up with wording for this condition and then that you take a vote on whether you want such a condition or not. So maybe Janet could come up with wording for the condition that she's recommending and then you take a vote on that condition and then you can move on with the conversation. Okay, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. Absent a clearly worded condition, I think we should move on and stop I, reviewing yeah, I'm, the I'm conditions. I'm ready to move, to move on myself. Um, I don't know. Um, Chris, did you think we were going to get through findings and conditions tonight? Or did you um, hope? I, did you... I had been, but I hadn't been expecting the comprehensive permit discussion to go on for quite such a long time. Um, so... Yeah, I think it's going to take at least an hour to get through the conditions and findings. Um, yeah, I guess I'm 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 not eager to get into that tonight. If we can push this back to April seventeenth, Tom, what's you what's the position on your your team's end? Are you guys chomping at the bit? Chomping at the bit. Uh, for what that's for what that's worth and yeah. i've got also for what it's worth and thank you for accommodating me this evening even though my hatfield hearing they missed the notice so it was continued anyways uh i've got a four o'clock 
hearing on Wednesday the 17th and the six o'clock in-person hearing on Wednesday the 17th. And so, you know, that kicks us over to May at some point and Barry's taking the buildings down April 22nd, maybe. Um, so yeah, we're we're chugging along and uh -huh. okay. we'll leave it to the board, but. Okay, well, so do people want to spend, let's say it's an hour to get through these findings and conditions this evening? Bruce, you up for that? Yes, reluctantly, but yes. And I hope we can get through this condition thing hurriedly. All right. All right. Um, Thank you. Sure. I, I, uh, I do need to give the public a chance to talk. So I think I will at this time ask for any public comment people want to make on this project. I see one hand so far. And as this first person makes their comment, if anybody else wants to comment, please raise your hand during that period. So Pam, let's bring uh, Hetty Startup over. Hetty, uh, welcome. If you would give us your, repeat your name and give us your address. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Hetty Startup. I live on Allen Street um, in Amherst. Um, and tonight, I, I just want to particularly thank Mr. Roberts for uh, the tour of the site um, as a member of the Amherst Historical Commission, both 55 and 45. It was really helpful. I was hoping in my question, as it were, to see if Tom Reedy could go back in the drawings to the plan of the apartments in the part of the scheme which is in the back of the site where, um, yes, thank you. <laughs> and I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> um, so if we could look at like, what would be the apartments at the back where 45 is going to be demolished? Yes, that's right. Yep, yep. Can you scroll down to, thank you. Perfect, thank you, Tom. Um, so this may be um, flogging a dead horse, uh, but I've been listening to the meeting tonight since the pretty much the beginning, and I was very intrigued at one point when you were talking about 70 Belcher Town Road to hear a fourth story mentioned. And I'm just wondering, and as I said, this may be flogging my dead horse about the history of this building, which is dear to me now that I know more about it. And also <laughs> because I think the building is in a really pretty good condition. And I'm just curious to know from Barry and um, from Jonathan on the sort of design team about um do you really need to pull this building down in order to get your um, apartments there in the back of the site? If you built four stories, could you raise everything up so that you could keep that existing staircase that creates the sort of stair between the second and third floor? And you could keep the performance space that is historic to both Amherst College and Amherst as a town and create some kind of wonderful um, group um, <laughs> sort of play space in, in the building um, that maybe it would be for entertainment or no, no, maybe that's not a good idea to suggest with all the licensing related to that. Um, I take that back. Maybe it could be something that is um, a shared space um, for um, exhibits or, for um, other kinds of uses um, that could be used by the people in the in the apartment building. And I'll stop there. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to keep talking so long. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom or Jonathan, anybody? Yeah, that's anybody probably Jonathan. A, and I know we had discussed it last time, but Jonathan, if you wanna talk about, and I'll probably go back to this one. Sure. So the, I don't think we would really be able to go up more. We're, we're already at five stories. 
Um, the, the, the fundamental problem is, is, the, is the size and shape of the floor plate in the existing building and its, and its proximity to the property line. Um, that, you know, there are currently windows in that facade, but there, you know, I, I don't like using this term because it doesn't really exist um, in, in true legal terms, but they're, they're there because they've been there a long time, as we would say they're grandfathered, but um, they, they wouldn't actually be permissible um and so it, it makes it very hard to adapt that space to to uh to a residential use um it, i think that that that's sort of the the and let me let me add on a little bit just to say that barry has i mean look at amherst cinema uh, look at Marsh House, look at him moving different houses uh, in town, um, center school over in Hatfield, and I'm sure he can name five more. If a, He's the type, if you can save it and you can reuse it, uh, despite other people maybe suggesting that he doesn't, he's going to save it and reuse it. And so this is just one of those, unfortunately... Um, and there's, and we look to balance, right? Just like with that entry plaza, it, it's all a balance. It's balancing landscaping. It's balancing seating. Same thing here. There are certain economic realities about what you need for sizes of units and the number of units you need in order to make something actually able to be built. And that's what, you know, through all of that, you put it in the blender and what comes out is unfortunately this space has to come down, but I can tell you the first thing that Barry did with John Kuhn was, what can we do with this? How can we reuse this? Is it reusable? Uh, and then it, it just kept coming back at, at no. Um, and, and that's where we are at this point. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right, uh, one more public comment I see from Brian Hoban, if we bring him mm -hmm. over. Yeah. Welcome, Brian. Please give us your name and your street address. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. My you name is Brian. Three minutes. All right. <laughs> I'm actually a uh, student at UMass Amherst uh, in the regional planning program. Um, so it's really cool to hear about uh, the different opinions expressed about student housing in Amherst. Um, and I'm really uh, thankful for all the consideration that's been given. Um, concerning student housing. I actually just want to briefly introduce myself uh, and just let you know that for the past couple months or so, I've actually been uh, designing an additional um, design and development proposal for the site uh, in Amherst. Um, however, I am aware that a lot of investment has already gone into the current design. So I'm definitely not trying to stir up any controversy or have you kind of reconsider um, the current proposal, but hopefully in the next coming weeks or so, um, I'd like to possibly introduce my design and maybe spur a conversation about future development uh, in downtown Amherst um, and hopefully contribute to, um, you know, maybe mediating solutions between different parties uh, and creating meaningful development that not only just caters to students, but also to the residents of Amherst. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Don't see any more hands from the public. Chris, your hand is up. Yeah, I was rethinking um, the decision uh, to keep going tonight. I think this is going to take a long time. You have to still talk about the um, payment of fee and lieu. You have to go through all of the findings for the site plan review and for the special permit. You could consider um, holding an interim planning board meeting say next Wednesday and focus only on conditions and findings for this project and then um, vote on it. But trying to get through it tonight, I think is gonna be challenging. And I'm sure that people are going to have, you know, their particular thing that they are interested in. And so it's not just a question of reading the conditions because there, I imagine there's going to be a lot of discussion about things. So I'm suggesting that you take a poll to see who's available next Wednesday or okay. who's available next Tuesday or some night that you can all sure. get together to um, to finish up this project. Thank you. 
All right, good idea, Chris. Uh, so members, uh, please raise your digital hand if you are available next Wednesday for a pretty focused uh, uh, meeting. One, two, three, and Bruce has got his physical hand. Janet's got her physical thumb. That's five. One, two, three, four, five, and I'm six. Uh, Johanna, sound looks like no, you're not available, six, but no. looks like six of us would be. So maybe uh, that's certainly a quorum. And uh, Johanna, any huge objection to us plowing through this without you? No. I'll try to make it, but I'm in Washington, D.C. for work, and it's a chock full day. So okay. if I can join remotely, I will, um, but yep. you shouldn't wait on me. Okay. All right. So, it look, Chris, it looks like six of us could be present for that conversation, so maybe we should do that. Um, so um, do we want to have further conversation tonight, or should we just go ahead with a motion to continue to what would it be, April 10th at 6.30 or 7? Chris? Yes. Continue um, to April 10th at 6.30? Yeah. Could we make it 7? Seven? 7. 7's fine with me. And um, Tom, I, what's your availability? I know you... you you know, you hate to have a free evening, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a six o'clock, but I'll make seven o'clock work because everybody's working with us. So seven o'clock works. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. For, okay. If you, hey, if you raised your electronic hand for that little poll, you, please put it down. And so that leaves Janet and Nate who want to make comments. Okay. Nate, go ahead. Sure. I was going to say we're all here and, you know, it'd be, I'd like to see if we could discuss a little bit more, you know, the payment in lieu could be a big topic. And I don't know if, if there's a, a way to get a straw poll now, because you know, that could be a, another half an hour, 45 minute conversation. We're here, you know, it'd be okay. great to start right. that, you know, sure. it seems like we're, you know, we've discussed the design, the plaza, you know, if there's issues with parking, I mean, in the development application report and in the emails from Tom, you know, we've gone over the different drainage and other things. So if there's a few outstanding issues, I, I know I'd rather hear it be discussed now if there's something, because it's not, you know, it could be that we get in on next week and we spend another two hours talking about things other than the conditions and findings. And so, you know, if there's anything else that seems to be an issue, I'd like to have it be discussed tonight or at least, you know, um, previewed. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Bruce and Janet. Bruce first. Uh, I'm. Uh, I was comfortable with the payment in lieu. I thought about it fairly uh, variously, and with the uh, announcement of the uh, housing trust, uh, um, I uh, I thought about it, and I don't have a problem with it. Okay, Janet. I was completely leaning towards requiring the three affordable units. And then I had a long, long talk with the um, chair of the housing trust and she completely persuaded me that the payment in lieu would be a really exciting opportunity for the housing trust and probably would result in many more units. And so I'm, I, I don't, I'm completely on board with that. I do wonder if um, all the issues that were raised by Jason Skeels and in Chris's memos about you know, stormwater and stuff, if that's all been addressed to their satisfaction. So that's okay. that's one thing it was, you know, I just wanted to make sure that didn't get brushed through or we would miss it. Yeah. That's something I could review for next time. Okay. I will say I was completely comfortable with the payment in lieu, uh, particularly with the housing trust's endorsement. Mm -hmm. Jesse? Yes, just to agree. I've been catching up on those details also, and I have no issue with them at all. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Johanna, since you won't be with us next time, how were you feeling about that? The Affordable Housing Trust is okay with it. I am okay with it. Okay, thank you. Fred. Uh, yeah, I strongly support it. Uh, I'll always have, I think that uh, this particular location is a perfect application for this. As I said, because of the parking situation and so forth, uh, the target uh, population here will not be a population that would benefit from the uh, uh, affordable housing situation and much better to use this to uh, work with the with the trust and uh, really accomplish something. So I strongly support it. Okay, thank you. Um, so Janet, uh, I'm thinking if you have a if you had a condition, if you had language for a condition that you've been working on while you've been we've been sitting here, uh, I, I, it'd be great if we could talk about that before or vote on it before Johanna is not with us next week. Um, I, I do have a slightly um, kind of verbose thing that is, I always like to write something and tighten it up, but here, here comes the uh, many prepositional phrases. If the percentage of tenants who are students exceeds 90%, the owner shall return to the planning board so the board can determine if any modifications to the management plan are required to ensure the safety, health and welfare of the student tenants. And so, and that that phrase ties into the 11.24, the whole purpose of the site plan review is for the health, safety, and convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town. And so I just do think it's a safety issue for students and we, bad things happen. Okay. All right, so Bruce, I see your hand, your physical hand. My digital hand. He has two. Um, <laughs> I was distinguishing between digital and electronic, but I I wasn't up to speed with your lexicon. <laughs> um, I I think I know where your uh, your um, motion ended and when your comment started, uh, Janet. So I think it's important that we that it be seconded, which I do, so that we can okay discuss and vote on it. All right. Um, so we have a motion, I, I'd say we have a motion to adopt that as a condition and a second from Bruce and board members, are you, do you want to have some more conversation about it or should we just go through a roll call vote? Bruce, Jesse. Yeah, sorry, Jenna, can you read the beginning one more time? So I had a little glitch in here. Yeah, just give yeah, us the... Give us the condition. Um, if the percentage of tenants who are students exceeds 90%, the owner shall return to the planning board so the board can determine if any modifications to the management plan are required to ensure the safety, health, and welfare of student of the student te tenants. So. All right. So, so I think I'll... Oops, I'm, go ahead, Jesse. I'll try and say what I meant to say earlier a little bit more clearly. I agree with the intent, Janet. It's it's the part of if it goes above ninety percent, just to play devil's advocate, having nothing to do with the current owner, landlord, management, anything. We're then depending on that information from the owner to to decide for the town to be told we're now above ninety percent, and that to me just doesn't seem like a realistic way to proceed. Um, likewise, if it's 80% and there's all kinds of problems, there are other mechanisms in the town that might address it, but there's, it doesn't help solve that problem either. So I, I, I just, again, I'm, I'm struggling logistically to see how this really would accomplish much in almost any scenario other than the owner saying, oh my gosh, I really need help town, help me out and do something, well, which they would do anyway, if it was 60% or 50%, right? We don't have okay. any mechanism to guarantee or to if it if there's a if 
if students are having problems, there's no, there's nothing in our bylaws that say this is a problem building because people are drinking too much and passing that's out. Yeah. 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 But that's what yeah, the math. And so that's the whole thing is so this would say if there are X amount of students in your building, we want to make sure there's supervision that that and we have that in our private student dorms. Okay, we so we so we have the we have the condition. Um, I'd like to get to a vote soon. Um, Bruce, your hand is up. Yes, I I don't need further discussion. Uh, we've had a lot of it. Uh, but what okay. I would like to do is to ask Tom whether he has any comment on the motion that would uh, either demonstrate uh, from a technical uh, point of view, from his point of view. That would uh, that would would the, the, whether it whether whether Tom you have any any wording or any suggestion that would strengthen it or make it more manageable or any comment at all that we should hear and then I'm ready to go. Okay. Sure. Th thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Bruce. I mean, I I think some of the issue is frequency or or timeline, right? So I didn't hear anything in there of when that's required um is it an, an annual thing is it once it happens and then what if it drops back below um is it something that the board just looks to condition period right if if this happens then you you don't even come back before us but you start doing this um and then it's up to the landowner if they just want to do that from the beginning right and and i don't know maybe Barry wants to have some resident manager on the site, right? That's the fear with something like this is what it actually means. And, and when you have somewhat uh, amorphous conditions, it's up to interpretation and then it slips through the cracks and it doesn't do what anybody thought it could do. And I think that's the rub with it. Again, I understand the intent. I, I hear what Janet's saying. I don't know that this is the, the right application for it. Um, or the right language to try to enforce something like that. I think that would be the concern. Okay, thanks, Tom. Janet? So I actually think that's a great point, and I think I have a better idea. And I would like to withdraw the motion and just submit this new condition, and we can mull it and talk about it very quickly next week. Because I think maybe we should just require on-site management when you hit that threshold. And then the mechanisms, we don't have to come back. So I'm, uh, uh, let me think on that. I think that's a great point, though. And I think what Jesse's saying also makes sense. Is so when you become a student, private student dorm, basically in Amherst, we're going to make sure that there are people there to take care of the students. And so let, let me think on that. And I'll come back on Wednesday and we can go up and down without conversation or, or as much discussion as you want. But I think that's a good point. Because what I'm really looking for is on-site supervision, really, at the end of the day. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see any other hands, and I think Janet's is a legacy. So, Bruce. I uh, move continuation uh, to uh, uh, April seven, 10th at 7. April 10th at 7 p.m. Okay. I'll second that. Could I get in on the discussion for one quick second? Sure, Tom. To, to, to Nate's point, is the, I know we mentioned the Jason Skills letter. I'm very comfortable with where we are with that. Uh, we've talked about payment in lieu, so I understand where we are with that. I'm assuming the last 9.22 going from 100% coverage to 97% coverage is probably going to be okay. Uh, I don't know if the board needs to or wants to talk about that. But besides that, is there anything else that we should be thinking about so that when we do come next Wednesday, it's all set, um, or, or are we just dealing with findings and conditions then? Um, I think we're just dealing with findings and conditions. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I can speak for myself. I'm not worried about your nonconformity going from 100% to 97% or whatever it is. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion to continue to next week at seven o'clock. Um, we'll go through a roll call. Do we need a second? Uh, I seconded. That's Doug. Mm -hmm. Second, thanks. 
All right. Um, Bruce. Aye. Approve. And Fred. I approve. All right. Jesse. Aye. All right. Janet. Aye. Uh, Johanna, you, you don't have to. Aye. Right. Aye. Okay. And Karen? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Seven in favor, no abstentions, no negatives on continuing to next week at seven o'clock PM. Thank you All very right. much. Tom and team, thank you for your patience before we even got to you. And thanks for your contributions to this discussion. Thank see you. Some, we'll see, you see some week. of you at least next week. Great. Okay, time now is 9.49. And we'll move on to old business. Any topics not reasonably anticipated? None. None from Chris, okay. How about new business not reasonably anticipated? None. None. Form A, A and R subdivision applications? None. Upcoming ZBA applications. I yeah, may have some. I'm not aware of anything new because I didn't get any transcripts. So if anybody else did, speak okay. now. Upcoming SPP, SPR, and SUB applications. We have a little farm stand up on East Pleasant Street. I think I told you about that last time. Yes. Yep. All right. So and the, the carriage house at the Family Dickinson Museum. Yeah, I think we told them about that last time too. <laughs> okay, so those are both still in process. Yep. All right, uh, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Uh, Bruce, you want to start with PVPC? Nothing to report. Okay. I have nothing. Oh, there is a, there is a meeting uh, next Thursday which I unfortunately won't be able to attend. I'll uh, email Jack and tell him that I'll not be able to attend. Okay. Um, I have nothing for CPAC. Karen, for design review? No, not this time. All right, and Chris, anything from CRC? Yes, yeah, CRC started talking about the um, solar bylaw. Yep. And they will um, be continuing that conversation. So, okay. Uh, report of chair. I don't have anything. Report of staff. Chris. I don't. Uh, I don't have anything at this time. All right. In that case, time is nine fifty-two, and unless anybody has anything else to mention, we are adjourned. Uh, we will see all of you, uh, excepting Johanna, next week at seven o'clock. Thanks for Bye. your thanks for your time and attention. Good night. Good night. Chris, get, Chris, get home safely. I'll try. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.